Okay, we're mostly uh, there. So um, I'm uh, Patrick Huber uh, from UC Davis. Uh, I am helping run this whole operation. Uh, so first and foremost, thank you everyone for showing up. This is exciting to see uh, the interest for what we're uh, trying to put together here. And I know the people have come from a long ways around the state and uh, this is great to see. Uh, just let's get a quick show of hands. How many producers are in the room? That's great. Uh, how many non-producers that are here to talk to the producers? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so, um, like I said, I'm uh, uh, from UC Davis. I'm here with my team. Um, Michael, do you want to say hi for the rock team? Hello! There, thank you. Courtney, Icy Foods. Yeah, so... Um, the three of us have uh, partnered on uh, this project that has gotten us all together here today um, with uh, funding from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So I'm going to uh, lead you through a little uh, intro to what's happening here. Uh, first, again, coffee, food, uh, bathrooms are around the corner back over here. And make sure to look at the table up uh, on that in the front over there uh, for materials from a number of uh, the guests that we have here today. Okay, so why are we here? Um, in 2020, uh, I think we all remember when the, the pandemic hit and we saw um, many uh, issues with the, the food supply chains in the U.S. Uh, issues that were pre-existing but were really exposed by what was going on, including in the meat sector. And so the Tomcat Foundation uh, worked with us uh, to put together a study on um, the issues that were coming to light in uh, California meat supply um, and uh, some potential solutions to some of those uh, issues. And um, following on from that, we applied to the USDA for funding to help actually start addressing some of these issues. So uh, we got funding for a three-year project uh, to help um, either augment or create a regional uh, supply chains here in Northern California for uh, high-value uh, meat products. Um, and so we launched that about two years ago. Um, there's several phases to this, some, uh, several opportunities that we really saw. Uh, the first that we spent maybe the first year focused on was the uh, institutional scale uh, procurement opportunities that might exist. So we've been working with the University of California Office of the President, their procurement team for the 10 campuses and four hospital systems that they run across California. Um, and that uh, was really kind of uh, culminated in um, a meeting, uh, a summit last uh, June that I know a number of you were at. Um, and we really uh, had good discussions and I think I'm cautiously optimistic that the UC system is moving towards um, trying to source uh, high value uh, regenerative meat from Northern California uh, for the campuses and uh, the hospital systems. Um, they're still moving through the, the contracting process, which as you can imagine is a fairly bureaucratic ordeal, but um, I'm cautiously hopeful that we'll see something in the next few months about what that's gonna look like and the opportunities for some of you here in the room. So that's one end. And then there's this other more direct marketing um, smaller scale buyers, processors that are looking for uh, meat. And um, so that's, so we decided that we put together this event here today to help do some match uh, matchmaking. Uh, so we have uh, producers, we have processors, and we have buyers that all have something to contribute and something that they uh, want from the others. And so uh, we'll be going through and hopefully having those discussions uh, uh, between, uh, between you to help set up some of those opportunities moving into the future. Um, right, so here on our workshop goals, again, bringing together the meat supply chain participants, um, connecting them, and then also connecting them with experts who have worked on this to uh, really help expedite the process of building out these supply chains. And um, again, bring, uh, bringing in brands, butchers, uh, and other, uh, other buyers uh, to help um, uh, facilitate uh, getting the regenerative meat products. So a little bit about what's going to be going on today. 
Um, as soon as I shut up up here, uh, we're going to go into a couple uh, uh, different panels, uh, the first of which uh, we're going to be looking at what some of the resources are um, for uh, producers uh, that are trying to get into, this, uh, into the direct marketing space. Um, so that'll be the uh, panel one. Uh, the second panel then will be uh, looking at um, what it, brand development, what it takes, um, what some of the opportunities are, what some of the challenges are. Um, then we'll break for lunch, uh, and after lunch, uh, we'll be discussing briefly uh, an information platform that we're working to uh, really, um, you know, make these conversations uh, easier to have with uh, publicly available information. Um, and then we'll move into the third panel, which we'll be discussing what regenerative actually means, what it is, um, and uh, how, how that's uh, being applied in the state. Once we're done with those, those panels, then we'll move into uh, the final session in the afternoon, which is going to be uh, speed dating, um, which uh, we'll have more details on that as we get into it, but we'll have a short little few minute opportunities uh, to meet a number of the people in here and see where there might be opportunities uh, to, um, for um, products, for you to um, pitch your products to people, see what opportunities are out there. Then after that, we will um, have um, a meat tasting. Uh, we're going to look at uh, fresh versus frozen ribeye and see what the differences actually are in blind tastings. We'll have a reception and then we'll move into uh, dinner at that point for those that are staying. Um, have I left anything out, Courtney? Are we ready to? Okay. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Courtney at this point who's gonna lead us through panel one. Great, thank you everybody. M Michelle and uh, Rebecca, please join, join us up here and make sure your mics are working. Uh, whichever ones you put that one's on. That one's working. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, um, actually I think Michelle's gonna go first so we can start with just one. So as Patrick was saying, this, um, this first panel is really to provide tools for all of you, producers and process, people who are in processing, thinking about processing. Um, Michelle and Rebecca both work for organizations that are just fonts of knowledge for how to do um, these markets and these systems the right way. And so uh, I'm actually gonna let them tell you more about what their organizations do because they, they both offer a lot that I think will be relevant to everyone here. But Michelle Thorne from the Good Meat Project, Rebecca Thistlethwaite from the Niche uh, Meat Processing Assistance Network, and Michelle, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and, and what you do. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks to the Roots of Change folks for inviting me. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Michelle Thorne. I'm the executive director of the Good Meat Project. We are based in Oregon, and we support farmers, ranchers, butchers, chefs, and consumers, basically connecting everyone along the meat value chain in order to bring good meat to market, supporting good meat producers, processors, butchers, chefs, and so on. So um, I am also a small producer in the state of Oregon by destiny, really. I'm the Good Meat Project Executive Director by choice, and I'm also a graphic design and strategic marketer by trade. And that's kind of my background. I have an MBA in sustainable business from Presidio. Woohoo! Um, and I'm really excited to be here. I really love talking to folks in the meat world. Of course, I was a vegetarian at some point. <laughs> and then I came to my senses. Um, but I'm really excited to be here because the Good Meat Project actually helps producers market their products. Whether you're selling wholesale, like whole animal, so some of the background of the Good Meat Project, it was founded by Camus Davis, many of you may know who she is. She wrote a book called Killing It, and she spent some time overseas apprenticing with a European family, learning butchery, and all of the wonderful things that go with that. And she came back to Portland and started the Portland Meat Collective. The Portland Meat Collective would have demonstrations of whole animal butchery 
actually helping people understand butchering an animal, what's involved, the different cuts, and that eventually became the Good Meat Project. So what we do is we have several programs. Our Farmin program, which is spelled F-A-R-M-I-N, sorry, I don't have any slides, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, but Farmin stands for Farmer and Rancher Marketing Innovation Network. And in that program, we have so many, can I say free? Does everybody like the freemium economy? Because we have so many amazing resources for farmers and ranchers. So in our farming program, we have our marketing fundamentals for producers, which is a 12 hour kind of four part course that goes from branding all the way to building a sales funnel. We have our local meat, local flavor trade promotion, which is also free and evergreen if you're selling whole animal and really helps give you the tools to use to market your products in your communities. Um, we also have our upcoming Real Burger of Earth Day. Who signed up for that? Awesome. I encourage all of you, if you are selling, raising, serving, sourcing grass-fed meat, it is a national promotion, it's free. We give you all of the resources that you can customize yourself to help raise the visibility of grass-fed meat for Earth Day. So it starts April 1st through April 22nd. There's a great sweepstakes for producers and consumers. I'll stop promoting that. We also have our Lowdown series, which you'll hear from Carrie Richards later. She's actually gonna be on that series on Thursday, wherever you are in the room, Carrie. <laughs> excited about that, where we talk to producers and share peer-to-peer -peer education so that we can all learn and be better marketers, marketing our products. And our bacon program, our bacon program is our butcher and chefs opportunity network, where we connect butchers and chefs with farmers and ranchers to help the follow through so that People who are raising animals can get into restaurants and serve, get on their menus, do really innovative things. So that's our bacon program. And we also have many other resources. I won't, uh, I mean, you should go to our website, goodmeatproject.org, and absolutely sign up for the Real Burger of Earth Day. There are some flyers that I have in the back there with a QR code and some information about our other programs. Um, what else could I tell you? There was a question you had. Oh, we were just going to ask about the program coming up in April. That is the Real Burger of Earth Day. So you can go to realburgerofearthday.com. The producer portal will be open on Friday, where you get to download all these amazing materials, all these images. There's a content guide. There's a playbook. We'll all be doing it in unison to help raise the profile of grass-fed meat for Earth Day because we all know that grass-fed meat is saving the planet. Yes, can we agree? <laughs> of course, yes. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the Good Meat Project and we're really excited because this year we are kind of taking things to uh, the next level. We have more people joining our programs and I'll just give you a little um, a little factoid, one of the impacts that the Good Meat Project realized in 2023 is our participants, 34% of them uh, reported an increase in revenue as expressed in dollars. And the only reason why that's relevant, of course it's relevant when people are making money doing what they love, um, but that's significant because it speaks to our resources and they're free. Did I mention that? They're free for producers, they're free for you. And we really hope that you take advantage of those because they're so robust. If you're not already on the Good Meat Switchboard, you can join the Good Meat Switchboard and talk to other producers across the nation. If you have something to share, something to sell, you need something, it's a great forum. You can follow us on social media. Um, there's the Good Meat Breakdown, which really helps their downloadable downloadable materials there that you can use on your website to educate consumers. How many people in this room spend time educating their consumers about what you do? Fantastic. Go to the Good Meat Breakdown 
and download some of those materials that talk about how much freezer space you need when you order a half, or how to cook a, a slow cook roast, right? Or which cuts are quick, you know, pan fried, and like so many great resources. So those are some things. And my last question before I pass the mic to my colleague in arms, Rebecca, I want to kind of gauge the temperature of the room. I know we're all wearing colored name tags, but if you, by a show of hands, how many producers are in the room? Wow. That's about, what, 65% maybe of producers. Awesome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing what you do. By show of hands, how many processors are in the room? Fantastic. We need more of you in the room. Thank you for doing what you do. Um, how many, are there any just straight consumers in the room? Awesome. Fantastic. Thanks for being here as well and supporting meat and meat production. Um, and that's chefs. chefs. Where are the butchers and chefs in the room? Fantastic. Welcome to. You all are a significant part of the supply chain. So thank you for being here. Awesome. So we're going to take questions today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions about the Good Meat Project, anything that we do. We're here to serve you and supply some resources. But for now, I'll pass the mic to Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I've got a few slides about what I do. So my name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite, and I'm the director of the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network, or NPAN for short. Uh, we are, are a really unique extension program that's housed at Oregon State University, um, but we serve a national audience. So we're a network of small-scale meat processors, producers, wholesalers, distributors, and everyone else in the supply chain. And we get together, get together to try to solve problems as a group and learn from each other. Um, kind of similar to the Good Meat Project, but we're extension. So we're a little bit more academic. And we also do research. Um, and we can't quite be as nimble as Good Meat Project. So I kind of rely on Michelle for certain things, like, like developing amazing marketing stuff. And um, she relies on me for, I don't know, getting grant money from the USDA, maybe. <laughs> we're pretty good at we're pretty good at that. Uh, so we've been around for about 15 years, and we're our our network is about 3,500 members now across the country. But essentially, what we do is we survey our members every year in January. We say, what are your challenges? What are your opportunities? What do you want to learn about? And then we create content for them. So we create content through webinars and videos through. Uh, case studies, guides. There's a brand new guide in the back that just got published last week on business planning for small-scale meat processors. Uh, we have two short courses. Oh, I should probably just use the slides here. Uh, so that's that's what that's what our mission is to basically get all of us in the supply chain working together um, to strengthen the the good meat supply chain or the niche meat supply chain as we call it. Next slide. Uh, and these are the things we do. So we have a listserv, an old-fashioned listserv that works really well. If you have any questions about like what kind of sausage stuffer to buy, that's, that's the listserv for you. It's very nuts and bolts. We also have a, a Facebook page for people who prefer that medium. And it's really just an in industry peer support network. Um, our website is just full of stuff. We try to be like a one-stop shop for people getting into meat processing or more experienced meat processors to find everything they need from business planning and feasibility studies to uh, grant writing to where to find consultants, architects, builders, um, equipment, etc. Then case studies, as I mentioned, um, and then we do a little bit of research. Next slide. We do a little bit of policy work, uh, not so much lobbying, but we call it po policy engagement. And we try to work closely with USDA, FSIS to help, um, help them be a little nicer to small scale meat processors. Um, we have a great newsletter. 
The MPPTA program is a consulting program. If you're thinking about starting a meat processing facility or you already own one, if you have any sort of consulting needs, uh, you can you can book free calls with different experts from around the country and get free consulting. Um, and then, yeah, and then we do some other consulting. I think that's it. Oh, and then we have two short courses that are online, uh, self-paced. One's called the Meat Processor Academy. So that is really geared towards startup meat processors or those in their first few years of business to strengthen their business acumen. And then the Western Meat School, which uh, has been around for about five years now. We've trained about 1,800 meat producers around the country on how to direct market meat and be a better partner to their meat processor. We're really about creating um, a lot more understanding of, uh, uh, for producers to have better understanding of how meat processors' lives are like and for meat processors to have better understanding of producers because we just saw way too much antagonism between those two communities and you still see it like I hop on this one Facebook page uh, called farm builder entrepreneurs and you just hear you see farmers complaining quite a bit about their processors and it's like okay will you open up a five million dollar facility work 80 hours a week and make two percent margins and we'll just we'll we'll see if you don't make any errors too you know it's probably not going to happen um, so just trying to get folks together talking to each other like this and and understanding each other's perspectives and the different challenges that we have so we can be better partners to each other because the producer can't survive without the processor, the processor can't survive without the producer, and so we're here to um, kind of strengthen the glue between those two communities. Um, and then I will just end those slides now. Oh, we also do lots of great webinars too, like Good Meat Project. Um, and we put them all on YouTube if you don't want to watch them live. So. Um, I think we're just going to op open up the floor now to questions. Sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Unless you have some to start. Uh, well, I do have one, one question and one... Is this on, everybody? Okay. Uh, just a, a framing. So when we began this project here, it was, it was coming out of COVID. It was at a point where the meat system had just been hugely disrupted. And... I really, in a way, you know, it was really hard for uh, producers to be able to access processors. And now we know that kind of the, the whole business cycle is completely switched and there aren't enough animals, right? And so I, I just want to hear your perspective on how you've seen these cycles flow. How do we kind of, kind of dampen these cycles and, and where do you see meat processing? I know we were talking particularly for the California perspective. so. Um, you know, when we started this cycle, there weren't enough meat processors. Now our meat processors are under capacity. How do we, how do we make this work? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that, both of you? Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question. Um, I used to farm here like 20 years ago and there, there wasn't enough meat processors, um, especially in Southern California. You guys actually have it way easier in Northern California. The majority of processors are in Northern California. But I would, I would definitely say California is one of the few states in the US that probably could stand to have a couple more processors in the state. Um, and there, there, was, there was less 20 years ago. There are more now, um, thankfully, right? But those processors are not gonna stay in business unless you stay in business and build your business as producers. Um, and so luckily we have things like, to, like our event today and we're gonna be hearing from some aggregators and distributors and others who are helping to move local meat into bigger markets like, like wholesale and retail and, and institutions. So you have, to have the, you have to have the buyer commitments, which is why you guys are doing this project. And those need to be long-term commitments, not like you have a chef who buys local for, for a month and then stops buying for the rest of the year but keeps the producer on the menu for the rest of the year. How many people have seen that? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of experiences like that. So you need those long-term commitments from buyers. That drives the whole system. The, the demand, the consumer, the buyer, 
is, is the pull that pulls the local meat through the entire system. If you don't have that, you, you don't push meat into the world. You don't push products into the world. They have to be pulled into, into the market, right? So it really comes from that buyer demand and those long-term commitments, which then means the processors can scale up and buy the right equipment and you know ha get the organic certification or whatever you want your processors to do to be able to have your nice meat get to market. And then that helps the producer scale up and plan their numbers and increase their herd sizes. So it's hard when you have you know, drought um, in cyclical beef markets, uh, and it's particularly acute right now with the lowest cattle numbers that we've seen like ever, and the, some of the highest beef prices that have ever been experienced. Like how do you get buyers like institutions like UC Davis and stuff to make a commitment to buying local beef when the, they're probably the highest prices they've ever seen, right? And so then you have to work with those institutions to be like, well, can you use lower value cuts? Can you learn how to cook roasts? Can you use ribs? Can you use offal? Can you use, you know, um, non... Yeah, well, no, oxtail's expensive now. Like, yeah, just, just the lower end stuff. Can you make value out of the whole carcass? Um, can you maybe reduce your portion sizes a little bit so that you can, you can spread your costs out over more plates, right? Um, can you buy frozen meat and buy it in bulk and get some discounts that way because you can you know, buy boxes and cases of, of roasts or something? Can you um, buy a lot when the market is cheap, store that meat for, for use later? I mean, there's a lot of creative ways. Can you use the bones to make stock? Can you, you know, just extract every bit of value off of that carcass? But that, that, takes, a, that takes a different type of food service system, obviously. That takes um, facilities to manage to bring in the whole carcasses, to use the whole animal, the cold storage. So there's a lot of moving parts to that system. But in my opinion, the, the most important thing in the whole, to create that long-term supply chain that's resilient to the cattle markets and the dips and the swings is long-term commitments from the producers and some of the brands that are here bu work, buying from producers to creating a long-term commitment to your processor instead of like flitting around and going from this processor to that processor because they didn't get the perfect vacuum seal or they didn't make your sausage exactly right or whatever, like making a long-term commitment to your processor and then long-term commitments from buyers. And I know that's easier said than done, so. Michelle? I mean, I would only just chime in from the consumer side, right? Like what Rebecca was just talking about requires demand. It requires demand from consumers. They're the last stop on that value chain. If there's demand in the market from the consumer side, right, it's the consumers are pulling the meat through. So if, you're, if you are in an aggregate program or you are an institution or you're selling wholesale, it's equally as important to educate consumers that are kind of orbiting around your business, whether they're in your, in your community, whether you're you know, doing local sales, direct to consumer, or you're in an aggregate you know, uh, situation with other farmers and ranchers, or you're selling bulk meat, or you're selling into restaurants, letting consumers know and educating them about, not just about your brand and your product and what you have, what we find a lot at the Good Meat Project, especially in branding, and I know Katie, you'll probably talk about some of this later, is that people don't really know who their customer is. Right? You really have to know who your customer is, and when I say that, I mean like really know who they are. So I'm gonna ask a question. How many people know 10 things about their target customer, right? Four, five people. Here's another question. How many people in this room know your cost of acquisition for that customer? That's a, yeah. <laughs> 
maybe, I don't know, right? That's, these are the things that are super important in marketing. A lot of people think marketing is Instagram. How many people think marketing is Instagram? Right, it's, it's a part of it, but it's really very mathematical and scientific and logical because you're really trying to get in the mind of your consumer. So if you are working to have your meat get pulled through the supply chain, you're really talking to the end consumer. You're talking to that person who's gonna purchase it from the wholesaler, from the grocery, directly from you, through some kind of uh, you know, wholesale program, restaurant, whatever, you're talking to that ideal consumer. And so it's really important to not only know who your target customer is, know the demographics, know the psychographics of that person, be able to understand what problem are you solving for them. A lot of people miss that in their messaging because they're, this is what we see. And I'm not accusing anybody in this room of this, but a lot of people talk about the features of their business or the features of their meat. Oh, it's grass fed, or we pasture, or we spend this, or we do this, conservation, water, like all of those things are great. One of the things that we did at the Good Meat Project, a couple of years ago, we absorbed the Grass Fed Alliance. Has anybody heard of the Grass Fed Alliance? So we absorbed them and that's what we run our real burger birthday through. And the Grass Fed Alliance was basically a research organization. We did some consumer research. And I'm wondering if anybody in this room, especially producers, know what consumers, what's, what's, what are the two most important things to the end consumer? What do you think it is? What helps them make that purchasing decision? Anybody? Price. How it was raised? Anybody else? Flavor. Who said flavor? Flavor? Health benefits. Who the ranchers are? So the relationship between the producer? The story. Convenience. Okay. All of these. So. I could break down each one of those answers and say, that's a feature or that's a benefit. People make decisions, especially purchasing decisions, based on what it's going to do for them. Right? So when you start talking about practices, people don't really care about that as much as they care about taste and value. That's what the research shows. That's what the research out of the Grass-Fed Alliance, the Consumer Insights research shows that people care about taste and value. And if you can communicate that along with how you build relationships with your consumers, along with who you are doing business with, along with your, your I did this presentation back in November or December about brand story, right? Most people, most producers, I find, tell their origin story. Oh, we're third generation, we've been here for however many years that is, 100 years, <laughs> 90 years, give or take, like my grandfather passed it down to me, we're doing these practices, we came from this, we started this business because, and all of that is important, like your brand story matters. But your, I mean, your origin story matters, but your brand story is the story of your brand. It is the story of your why. Your origin story is your how, how you do what you do. Well, we pasture, we have rotational grazing, we have this many acres, blah, 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 our animals are this genetics, right? All of that is really important. But telling your brand story is really communicating your why. Why do you do what you do? Can anybody tell me what, in a sentence, why do you do what you do? Why? Because... Do you think that that, Matt, did, you, did everybody hear what he said? Because it creates local jobs. 
and it gets good food to the people who want it. How does that impact your local community? And does that matter to your consumers? That's your why, right? So in your marketing and your branding, if you're communicating that to the end consumer, right, that just keeps that supply chain moving that Rebecca was talking about. Because we need the pull. We need the consumers who are going to the grocery store. And this is something that we haven't, this next point is something that I know we've talked about, price, right? It's difficult. It's a challenge because the hard work that farmers and ranchers do require it to be at a certain price point. And in economics, there's an equilibrium, a price that people can pay, right? And a price that the producer has to sell it at. Those two things don't, they, they say, the young people say now, it's not mathing, right? <laughs> it's not mathing. You have to sell at a, at a price that gives you your pros, profit margin, but it means that there are some people who just can't afford it, and sometimes those are the people that really need it, right? So it's a, I acknowledge that it's a difficult balance, but I think it's about, like Rebecca said, getting creative, right? If you can sell your high value cuts into a distribution channel that can support that, great. And then you can aggregate your ground beef, maybe inst inst into institution. Great. Or if there's some other way that you can get creative, but the bottom line is, is really understanding the consumer because they're the ones who are taking out their money and giving it to, whether it's the restaurant, the wholesaler, directly to you as a producer, and that creates the demand. Any questions out here? Thank you, Michelle. That was super helpful. Um, I have uh, questions for each of all. Um, Michelle, I'll start with you. Um, I'm so excited to meet you in person. I have really benefited from the Good Meat Project. They have awesome um, resources uh, and pre-made plans to sell your products and wares. I didn't pay for that. <laughs> Um, I was curious if you will be offering any uh, in-person trainings um, in Southern Oregon and Northern California? That is a great question. So now that COVID is a little bit behind us or a lot behind us, maybe depending on who you are and what you think about it, uh, the, the short answer is yes. We absolutely want to get back to doing in-person. That's our roots. Um, so we are toying with the idea of having an event at the end of this year, probably in Oregon, because that's our backyard. We like to fail small. So, you know, if, um, if you're on our newsletter, then you'll hear about that. But it will be a featured event for a producer, a local producer, a local butcher, and a local chef. And I think that'll be really exciting. So short answer is yes. And a question for Rebecca. Um, Rebecca, I have really um, benefited from your Oregon State um, Online Western Meat School. I did that series, so it was super helpful. Will you have an opportunity to have some online workshops to um, give folks ideas about value-added products? Um, in terms of like creating your own value added products or working with your processor or co-packer to, to, to create them? Correct. Yeah. I mean, more so than just, you know, like the tallow bomb and so forth, but just, um, especially appealing to niche markets. Yeah. We're actually, we just, uh, closed applica the application window for a new business accelerator that we're starting called the Western Meat School Business Accelerator. If there's anyone in the room who wants to join it, we, will, we could open that window back up, but it's going to start in April. And that's really going to be geared towards uh, producers that are starting to get into wholesale markets and want to bring a product to market. So you'll be paired with a business coach um, and a new product development specialist. Uh, you also take some classes as a group, 
um, and the goal of, of the program is by the end of the program you'll be ready to launch a product, whether that's a CPG product or RTE product or you know, maybe one of those cool ground beef blends that includes liver and heart or something to get uh, your own package and label and get it on store shelves. So yeah, that's, that's one of our newest programs. If you're interested, talk to me afterwards. And the Good Meat Project is participating in that as well. Yeah. She's going to do all the marketing education. <laughs> we, we have time for more questions. Anything about logistics or processing or operations or should you start your own processing plant? No, but. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bill, um, Bill. California Grays. I was talking to my butcher the other day, and he wants to make some jerky and some beef sticks, but um, how can we get it certified to be able to sell at the farmer's market or fruit stands or something? Is he USDA? No. Okay. So, no. <laughs> no. Um, you have to be either state inspected or federally inspected. You could, you can do uh, value-added products under what's called retail exempt. But that, that has to be you doing the processing. So like restaurants are retail exempt, um, butcher shops are retail exempt. So you basically can rent a commercial kitchen for like one day a week, uh, maybe a restaurant on their closed day, and then you can make meat products. Um, it has to start with USDA inspected product, but you can do the, the further processing in the kitchen. And then you can sell that at farmer's markets. I know a lot of folks in California that kind of start dabbling in butchery that way. Um, but then you can't wholesale a whole lot. There's a maximum limit of how much you could wholesale. So say you want to get it into um, gas stations or whatever, um, you'd be limited on wholesaling. But that's one, that's one way to, to get your foot in the door is called retail exempt. And you don't have to own a butcher shop or a restaurant to do it. You could literally just rent it one day a week and make products. He can't make it for you, though. You would have to do it yourself. Yep. 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 You can do it that way. Oh, okay. He was asking if he could make uh, jerky or snack sticks in a custom exempt shop and turn around and sell that meat. And the answer is no. But he could do it under retail exempt. And the added point was that it has to be processed at a USDA plant, even if you're yeah. going to do the processing. So it has to have that. Has to have a stamp. There. Yeah. Okay, uh, one of the things that we've been hearing a lot about the last couple of years has been um, labor shortages for small processors. Are you still hearing that? Has that eased at all? And do you have suggestions for solutions to that problem? That is a great question, Katie. Um, and we're in the middle of a, of a very large grant to develop a new workforce program in Oregon at a community college up there called Blue Mountain Community College in Pendleton. So we're doing the research right now, uh, surveying processors around the Northwest on labor shortages, what kind of skills they want their employees to have, what they would pay to send their employees to. Um, and so we're getting a lot of really juicy data about that. So it's, it's a bit complicated. I will say, on a positive note, wages in the industry have improved dramatically in the last three or four years. Uh, on par with construction wages. So now in the Northwest, we just did this data, you can make as much money working in meat processing as you can in construction, which is amazing, because that's the main competitor for, for those people, basically, is that trade, right? Um, so that's, that's good news for the employees, um, but you know, finding skilled employees is hard, and retaining them, retention is very low. Um, they, the turnover rate is like 40% a year, so it's, it's quite high. Um, and so th the most important thing that processors can do is create a positive work environment where their employees want to stay. I know it's a novel concept, particularly in meat processing, but it's highly effective. Uh, it's not a fun place to work. Let's just be super honest about it. You're standing all day on concrete in the cold, 
carrying heavy things. There's typically no natural light in these facilities. I'm not sure why they don't have windows. They should consider adding a few windows, maybe an employee break room, bathrooms, shower, uh, childcare, you know, the list kind of goes on. But yeah, creating a positive workforce, positive work environment and professional development opportunities. Your employees, this is very true of millennials, they want opportunities to grow. They're always pushing and striving and wanting to learn. And so give them opportunities to take on projects. Maybe they get to make their own sausage or come up with their own recipe or develop a new recipe for snack sticks or give them opportunities to build their own product and then send them to courses and workshops to improve their skills. I would say those are the probably the most effective things. And one of the things that the Good Meat Project did, actually Rebecca was an advisor on this project. Uh, we got a grant last year to do some training handbooks for a pilot program in Oregon. And so we have the new butcher's training, apprenticeship materials, and a handbook. Did I mention that it's free? <laughs> so if you are a processor and you're speaking with young people and trying to attract them into this trade, which I think is absolutely beautiful. Butchery is just a beautiful craft. Um, one of these training materials help processors almost vet young people, right? Give them an opportunity to see it. There's this, I mean, it's 100 pages, both of these handbooks. You just email me, and I can send them to you if you're interested. But we are hoping to grow that as a ramp into processing and butchery to kind of help support this workforce development because it, it really is a crucial part of like keeping this pull through. You have to have a trained or skilled workforce in butchery at the processor to make it all happen for the producer, for the consumer. Like it's just all tied together. So that's all I wanted to add. Actually, as an answer to the, um, the gentleman <clears throat> about jerky, and I have a USDA sausage maker in Rancho Cordova who's amazing, and he had never made mortadella before, and last year it was like the meat of the year, so I thought, okay, I'm trying mortadella. And a local sandwich place bought every piece of mortadella I bought and sold it in a week. And so there is a really good, his name is Adam in Rancho Cordova, USDA certified, and is like a sausage maker from his background coming from another country, so really cool guy. Awesome. There's a gentleman behind you too. Oh, love it. Look at all these questions. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Um, oh, just a second. On the processing question, um, California was really innovative with legislation that favored boutique wineries and craft breweries. It seems like with meat processing, that same type of, you know, re reducing the barriers to entry and the reducing the barriers to scale is going to be critical at some point, unless otherwise we'll just be chasing away forever. What, what are we collectively, what's the industry doing to reduce those barriers for, for growth? That's another great, great question. Um, our state, Oregon, is a great model uh, for what California could do. Washington is also doing the same thing. Um, they not only started a state meat inspection program in Oregon, it's the first one launched uh, in the last 30 years of any state. So now we have state employees that can go to shops and help them actually write their HACCP plan. They're very helpful and they help you figure out what your shop needs to do to come under inspection. So that's one thing California can do. I'm not really sure why CDFA, there's, there's some in the room, uh, have, have not pushed for state inspection. I know it's expensive and a lot of work to start. It took Oregon about two years to jump through the hoops, but they're doing it. So that would be one thing. And then the second thing that Oregon and Washington did was a small meat processor grant program in the, two, the last two legislative cycles. Uh, the last round, me and Michelle got to be on the review committee, which was super cool because, man, there's going to be some sweet projects happening in Oregon in the next couple years. We're super excited. But they just gave out $8.5 million in small grants to both startups and existing facilities to expand both slaughter and cut and wrap. And 
California always seems to be flush with cash. They spend a lot of money on a lot of things, but they have yet to have a small meat processor grant program. So those are two things I think would go a long ways. The other thing that California has particularly hard time with, I used to ranch in central coast of California, so I, I, I have a lot of empathy for you folks. Between you and New York, you have the most regulated state in the country. Um, and your, um, those water boards that you have are, are especially uh, challenging. Um, but one rule that you really got to get changed in the state is the fact that you can't compost mammalian waste. You can compost humans in California. You can't compost any other mammals. Last time I checked, humans were mammals. Um, the fact that you can't compost mammalian waste is a huge problem for your state. Your processors are spending so much money trucking that material to landfills when they could be just composting it in their backyards. You know, like redwood meats up in Eureka, out in the middle of nowhere, got plenty of farmland out there to compost waste from their facility. They have to pay to ship it to a landfill like a couple hours away. That cost is untenable. Um, and so that is squeezing your processors really hard. I'm sure there's a couple in the room who can attest to that. So um, I would advocate for getting that rule changed. And I think UC Davis being a partner on this project could do the research that shows, you, you, I know you can compost dead dairy cattle, I think, in California, but like, why can't you compost uh, meat scraps and blood and other stuff like that from meat processing facilities? That's ridiculous. So those are a few things I suggest for your state. Uh, on that note, I'll just toss in that we, um, we know there's a, a group at Chico State that's actually doing that research right now and getting some of the data so they can help push that through. So we'll keep, keep connecting with them and see if they can uh, make that work. Is there a question over here? I think you probably just talked about some of it in a different um, angle, but when you originally said um, there might be people interested in starting a small shop to go with their product, don't do it. You said that earlier. Why? I was referring more to like a USDA slaughterhouse. Uh, well, first of all, it's about $600 a square foot. Uh, it's not viable for anything less than about 5,000 square feet. So you're talking about startup costs of about $5 million, right? In California, then you got to get your water board to approve or your, your county, city, county, um, municipal sewage system to agree to connect to you. Or if you're rural enough, uh, then you've got to get them to permit some sort of wastewater system, whether that's an engineered wetland or a gigantic septic leach field system or tanks. Those hoops are, are very high, or those hurdles are very high in California, like harder than any other state in the country. Um, so that, that whole process probably would take you about five years to be able to even get through that process in California. So you have to have, you know, the incredible patience, very deep pockets, and then you have to have commitments from producers to even open your door. You know, you know and there's, there's, there's some folks here in the room who had an experience with a facility uh, recently that didn't survive, you know? They didn't have those long-term commitments. The regulatory environment was very tough. They had some humane handling issues that, that set them back and had them shut down for a little while. Um, and if you're shut down for a couple weeks and you lose that cash flow, like you're, you're probably going to have to lay off your employees and then good luck getting them back. It's just, yeah, it's a, you basically, to, for, today I wouldn't open a slaughterhouse if I didn't have at least 2,500 head minimum that, that could come through, that, through the door year-round. It has to be year-round, too. California all likes to finish at the same time of the year. You all like to bring your cattle to the slaughterhouse at the same exact three-month window, right? What about the other um, nine months, too? So if I was starting out in California, I would start with the retail exempt butchery. I would just focus on making those cool, interesting products, um, rent it, leasing a commercial kitchen to do it one day a week, 
taking your USDA product, uh, making some cool sausages, taking it to farmer's market, testing it out with consumers. And I would, I would start really small and kind of work, maybe work backwards. And I wouldn't, wouldn't go to building a slaughterhouse until you have markets for at least 2,500 head. Does that make sense? Does that sound a little scary? <laughs> No, it doesn't. Um, I just did a feasibility study for a USDA mobile slaughterhouse in Southern Oregon. Uh, it never penciled because you could never get the throughput. You could never get enough animals killed on a daily basis because that's just slaughter and you don't make your money on slaughter. You make it on the cut and wrap. If you just have a mobile slaughter unit, th there's no margins in that, and you can't get enough throughput to actually make a profit on it. So it works in a few locations, like the islands of Washington, the islands off the coast of Alaska, um, some large bison ranches in the Dakotas where they have their own mobile slaughter trailer. It, it will work in a few locations, but most places it's not viable. Thank you for the great work you do. Um, do either of your organizations provide funding resources? Be, you're speaking to economics, you're speaking to the, the delta between profitability, producer offtake agreements, um, and the other sort of nuances. And, and if you could speak to the challenges in funding outside of grants, for example, commercial funding for these producers and processors, the dependencies that they have around the infrastructure and the challenges that um, you know, we all see, and how do we solve those? How much time do you, do you want have? To start? <laughs> right? it's, a, like that's, it's a big question. It um, is a big yeah. question. It's a big question. It's an evergreen question. I would say, you know, the Good Meat Project, one of the things that we continue to do is peer-to-peer -peer education. So last year, so we have this series called The Lowdown. And if anybody's familiar with Alec, Alex Miller, of Lick Skillet. So he did um, one of our lowdown series and talked about pricing for profit. It was one of the best, most attended, um, you know, presentations in the series of the lowdown. We don't specifically do business training, for example, or do profitability studies. It's, that's just not our wheelhouse. However, I'm particularly interested in making sure that ranchers and farmers and producers stay viable. It's just something that has to happen in order for them to be able to market their products, right? So how we, how we deal with that is we partner with the Western Meat School where we can combine our training because really being profitable is good business management it's good marketing, it's knowing your numbers, it's like keeping good books, it's knowing your consumers, it's knowing your distribution channels, it's knowing your product mix, right? Like it's, there's a lot <laughs> to profitability. And what we understand at the Good Meat Project is most farmers and ranchers aren't marketers, which is why we do what we do to kind of give you the tools and the resources to not have to spend money marketing, right? You'll still have to spend some. Maybe it's time or money, like these are trade-offs. Um, but pricing for profit and things like that and education resources and technical assistance, that's kind of where we try to talk about some of those things where you can get information directly from the person who has the information. It's not necessarily the Good Meat Project because we don't, we're not a business center in that way, right? But we try to get those people in the door in order to create the conversation, to have producers come to those things, ask those questions, and really analyze, okay, maybe I can look at my pricing, or maybe I can look at my market, look at you know, some of the demographics of my consumers and really get creative in my product mix, and sign up for the Western Meat School where we're kind of putting all of this information and aggregating it together in one program to, to be able to not just speak to one business model, 
but really looking at different business models and the profitability of those. I don't know, maybe you can add more to that. Um, well, back to the sort of funding mechanisms, um, you know, Biden invested a billion dollars into diversifying our meat processing infrastructure in this country. Hopefully some California folks took advantage of that. I don't know, anyone know if California got any MPERG or MPEP grants to... A few. A few. Oh, no slaughter that you know of? Okay, that's unfortunate. I know the local MCAP grants, which were for uh, equipment and um, smaller grants, they're just, those awards are just being made right now, just being announced, so hopefully some uh, California processors got some of that money. Um, I mean, that was sort of an unprecedented opportunity to get some cash. Uh, but there is talk of putting that in the farm bill and having small meat processor grants be a perennial feature in the farm bill. They won't be as large of grants, um, but those should definitely be taken advantage of. Um, there's other grant programs like the value-added producer grants, which can help fund you to develop like value-added products. Um, there's the Food Supply Guaranteed Loan Program. That's another USDA program, and that can pay for infrastructure. Um, there's also uh, one that pays for cold storage. Um, I forget what it's called, farm, farm storage loans, but those can be used to pay for cold storage. So there's a lot of resources out there. The grant writing side of things can be really challenging. We have a couple consultants on our technical assistance team that are grant writers for the meat processing industry specifically. And you can book a call with them on our website just under the technical assistance tab. It's free. Uh, you can get a couple hours with each consultant. So those are a couple opportunities. More creatively though is I, I have seen a lot of producers and processors work creatively uh, to get the infrastructure that they need. Like, uh, I'll just give you an example. I used to be a pig producer. It was very hard to find a USDA slaughterhouse in California that would um, scald and scrape, right? That would leave the skin on. Um, but a lot of our restaurant accounts wanted skin on roasts. Um, and we didn't want to lose all that value either by pulling the skin off. Um, so there was a processor, this wasn't our example, but a processor in Oregon called Revel Meats that needed a new hog scalder. They also couldn't do scald and scrape because their hog scalder was broken. They were brand new owners, they didn't have a lot of money, and a, a brand new hog scalder is a couple hundred thousand dollars. And so their biggest pig producer bought them a scalder and leased it back to them. I was like, that's brilliant. You know, like the producer wanted them to have this piece of equipment. They couldn't go to a bank to get a loan for that. And they, they, they created a partnership that works. So there's other creative ways to kind of come together. And, and the beauty of those relationships is that it just strengthens that partnership between the producer and the processor, which is what we need. Any other questions or are, are we at time? I was going to ask about the, the cut and wrap side of things. Is it similar to that, the butchery or, you know, slaughterhouse model? Is that a more viable option on getting an actual certified cut and wrap facility? It, it's definitely easier in California because uh, then you don't have to be zoned for slaughter. It's very hard to have the appropriate zoning to be able to actually do slaughter. Even your agricultural zoning in your state generally doesn't allow for slaughter. And then you have some counties that prohibit slaughter altogether within their county. Um, so yeah, it's always gonna, it, it's gonna require way less infrastructure. You could have a space this size, you know? You could have a couple uh, reefer units parked in the outside and parking lot to, for your um, cold storage and for aging your carcasses or you could just bring in boxed meat and then do the further processing in a smaller space that you just lease, you know? So that's certainly a, a lower cost of entry and easier regulatory environment to get started, yeah. Okay, one last question. Hi there, uh, so I just wanted to clarify a couple things about the retail exempt. I didn't realize that, um, is, it, is it that all, kitchen, all, all kitchens and restaurants would be sufficient for retail exempt production? 
And then, I, and then the, the next question I had was, you're able to then uh, wrap that, that production. You're able, without a meet, like, do you need to have a meat inspector's license or something like that to be able to package it and retail it? So I don't, I'm sure CDFA requires like a, a meat handler's license or something, but that's different than inspection. It's just a, li a license that you purchase every year. Um, so any commercial kitchen space uh, can be retail exempt. So whether that's a restaurant or butcher shop or even the butcher case of a grocery store. Those or a food hub. Okay. Those all fall that's under retail exempt, which basically just means you don't have to have a USDA inspector there watching you do your processing or checking on you every day. And you, you just work with your county health department to have it licensed. Okay, and so you could, you could uh, cut up those USDA carcasses yep. in there and then package them and retail yep. them. Okay, cool. Yeah, you could sell right out of the shop or you could actually take that stuff to farmers markets or a farm stand and sell it there. Yeah. It's not going to have the USCA label on it, but it will have the address of where you process it. Can I jump in? I I'm Dusky and we used to have a restaurant called Zazu Kitchen and Farm and we made bacon and salumi there and I don't know if if we got it wrong, because of course, who your inspector is, you may get a different message than what you just shared. But for us, what we had to do is my husband had to be a CDFA certified meat handler and our space, in addition to the county health department, we had to have meat permits on our space. So you, it can't just be a restaurant. The restaurant has to be subject to the CDFA inspection once a month. Hmm. Okay. But you were also wholesaling, right? We were wholesaling, but that was different than what we were making in the restaurant because we have a co-packer that's USDA in Oregon. So the yes, but no. Okay. Okay. I hate to say it, but we're out of time for this. Okay. Luckily, uh, Michelle and Rebecca will be here all day, and I know that there are lots more questions you have for them, so find them at lunch and at the reception, and please join me in thanking them for sharing a little bit of what they know, because we know they know a lot. Thank you, ladies. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Michelle and Rebecca. That was great. Um, we're going to jump into our second panel now, and we're going to be looking at uh, some examples of brand development and what some of the opportunities and challenges are with that. And we're going to let uh, Michael finally talk and uh, lead us through this panel. Thank you. Uh, before we bring the next panel on, I just want to do a shout out because Doris Meyer worked her butt off to pull this event off. Yeah. Um, she is unbelievable. The amount of things that she did to get this done. So I just want to thank you and everybody knows you because of all the good communication. So thanks. Um, yeah. So next, let's, let's add the next panelist to come up, Regina Hanna from Crown H Cattle. Joe Morris, come on up from Morris Grassfed and Katie Aldhoff from Chop Local. So um, this panel is a chance to hear from three people who do direct marketing, uh, different kinds of direct marketing. Uh, they each do it a different way. Uh, so we thought it might be interesting. I just have two brief questions for them, and then it's like we just saw, it's gonna be you guys engaging them. So um, why don't we start with you, Regina? And if you could just briefly describe your operation. Hello. Hi, Regina Hanna, uh, Crown H Cattle. I'm a cow-calf operation located in Northern California. I sell shares of beef and also uh, direct-to-consumer belted Galway beef. Yes, now it's working. All right. I'm Katie Oltoff. I'm the co-founder of Chop Local. Uh, we are an online farmer's market for meat specifically. We work with about 60 farmers and ranchers across the country to sell their meat on choplocal.com. Um, I'm, I'm here from Iowa. Is anybody here from further away than I am? 
I didn't think so. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we're based out of Iowa, but we have farms all over the country, like I said. Uh, and then we also have an arm of our business where um, we provide free and low cost educational resources to farmers and ranchers and butcher shops selling direct to consumer, really focused on selling online, either via e-commerce or um, other online resources like your website, your social media, that type of thing. So a little bit of both sides, um, the educational component as well as actually operating the online farmer's market at choplocal.com. Uh, yeah. Um, Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Joe Morris, and um, we own Morris Grass-Fed Beef, TO Cattle Company, and we have been um, marketing directly to consumers for about 33 years, and um, we are mainly focused on the relationship between the animals and the land, and we graze about 2,000 animals in the wintertime uh, and many fewer in the summertime. Thank goodness, so we can take a little break every once in a while. We market um, our, our beef to about 400 families in the Central Coast in Northern California mostly, although we do take one trip a year to Southern California, and we can explain how that works. Um, and our marketing is designed to keep me on the ranch and focused on that primary relationship of animals and land. Great. So those were the brief descriptions. Now we're going to, what I really want to hear from each of you that I think would be interesting is like, uh, you've done it different amounts of time, different ways. What has been the secret to your success? What is it that you do that makes it successful in uh, 30 years? I mean, that, that's a sign of success. Um, you know, how did you do that? And what is it that you focus on most? And uh, why don't we go in the, in the, why don't we start with Regina and then go to Joe and then we'll go to you, Katie, okay? Um, I got started in 2020. I uh, began selling um, shares of beef. I started with, um, I was very intrigued with the belted Galway um, breed. So I got one for, from our uh, local artificial inseminator. He knew that I wanted to start a collection. So once you get one cow, you know, you have to have a couple more. And then I wanted some red ones and I wanted some done ones. And so uh, once I started creating the collection, I had to figure out how I was going to pay for them. So in growing our story and our brand, um, it's been neat just to be who we are. Um, that authenticity, I find, is really important. And if you just tell your story, it's pretty easy to be authentic. Um, you know, as ranchers and farmers, we're the worst at telling our own story. You know, we're too busy hustling, getting work done or we don't want to brag, or we don't want to be show-offs. So we're not always very good at highlighting the cool things that we do, um, not only with our livestock, but the land that we live on. So I started raising um, the belted Galway and collecting them, and then I took the leap and started an Instagram account, um, a website, and then as I um, expanded from selling shares to cuts, then I also created um, an e-commerce site, uh, Shopify. So a lot of our marketing um, is done through Instagram, um, a newsletter, and then the two uh, uh, websites that we have, the landing site, which is through Squarespace, and then the Shopify e-commerce site. So that's just the marketing in just a really tight nutshell. So how did we do it? Um persistence and um, creative planning you know 35 years ago I learned about holistic management and that um, and that was kind of that was life changing I, I was born as my mom says with my boots on so I am a cowboy always loved the cattle and the ground the land and all that went with it I thought it was beautiful it, struck me very deeply as a little kid and still does today. Um, but I didn't know how that connected to the, to the big picture, the common good. And I also had aspirations to contribute to the common good. And 
uh, when I came across Alan Savory's work, um, it, it, it all of a sudden occurred to me that that is exactly what I am meant to be doing. And so um, my wife, Julie, and I began a business trying to figure that out. And using the holistic decision-making framework, we continued to come back and, 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 uh, and, and plan our, our, our profit in light of the context in which we live. And, and one of the weak links was a marketing weak link. And we discovered that we could add substantially to our um, profitability by turning relatively low-value animals um, open heifers into high quality meat um, but it it shouldn't be lost that if I didn't understand the cosmic connection between grazing and health of the planet and everybody on it neither do our customers and uh, while I am I am laser focused on the uh, the taste, the flavor, as I said, of our beef and the quality of that eating experience. I am also laser focused on uncovering for our customers and ourselves those values that are inherent in that animal doing her or his thing out on the land managed by people. And that has been a very big sell selling point, and I, I, I believe that, as Regina said, that authenticity, um, when I talk to my customers, they can't help to see that is what I'm about, and, and they like it. I don't really know where to start here. There's a lot to unpack. And part of it is um, part of what Rebecca and Michelle mentioned earlier has been keys to success. So with Chop Local, we took the approach of a almost like a cooperative. We're not formally structured as a cooperative, but the idea is that there are customers all over the country looking for direct-to-consumer meat and what it can provide for them. And there are farmers all over the country who need technological help to get their meat online. We primarily work with farmers that are selling retail cuts. Um, and so this idea of the cooperative and the one-stop shop for people to come and find the meat that is right for them is really what drove Chop Local in the beginning. Uh, Rebecca mentioned in earlier pull marketing, pulling the meat through the system. And that's one of the things that we really focus on on Chop Local is pulling in consumers who already know that they want local meat, but somebody mentioned convenience, they can't find it conveniently. And so we're working with these producers that can ship it directly to their door. It's like families like me, I have three kids, I live in a rural area, for me to go to the farmer's market and buy my meat directly, like that's just not happening in this phase of my life. But can I get online and order? Actually, I buy a quarter and I buy a half a hog every year. But for, I can get online and I can order the specialty products that I want and it's much more convenient for someone with a lifestyle like mine. Our poll marketing is primarily done through search engine optimization, which means that when someone searches for the term local beef, local, they search for things like half a cow. I know that's not what most of us would ever search for, right? But that's what our consumers are searching for, is half a cow or local meat farms or meat farms near me. We've worked hard um, on Chop Local to optimize for SEO so that we come up towards the top of Google. And then we also use Google Ads so that people that are already searching for products that we See, offer. What is an SEO? SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. And that is how you get to be the top of Google when somebody searches for a product like yours, okay? Um, there's, for all of you in the room, we actually have a webinar and resources on local SEO, local search engine optimization, so that you can get to the top um, of Google when someone searches for meat in your area, okay? So just check that out. Um, another thing, Regina mentioned authenticity. That is huge. We try to keep photos of our farmers 
there, we say farmers in Iowa, so I'm sorry. Everything's a farm, okay. Um, our farmers, our butchers, our ranchers, we try to keep photos of those people front and center in all of our marketing because yes, the meat has to be amazing. That is like a prerequisite that you have to have great meat. But when you add that authenticity on top of it and you can provide the transparency, it makes people feel good about where their meat is coming from. And Michelle mentioned this earlier with, you know, taste and value are really, really important. But the consumer is asking, what does this do for me? But a lot of consumers, and you all mentioned this earlier, some of them are concerned about their health. Some of them are concerned about the environment and they have these goals to improve the environment through their consumer behaviors or through their purchasing habits. Um, some of them are more concerned about animal welfare. When you share your story authentically, you can give them peace of mind that they are helping to reach their broader societal goals by purchasing your meat. And that's really, really important. It goes back to what Michelle talked about in sharing your brand story. And it goes back to what she mentioned with features versus benefits. Uh, we, live in, we live in the land of Angus cattle in Iowa, right? And certified Angus beef has done a great job of, of already telling consumers that Angus beef is, I know you'll argue with me, but certified Angus beef has told consumers that Angus beef is superior, that you are going to get a great product, right? They've already shared that benefit and they've made that very clear to consumers. But we stopped in the nugget, gross, nuggets, nugget, is that what it's called? Okay, so there's the certified Piedmontese beef. I'm not gonna lie, I don't know what the benefits of certified Piedmontese are. Is it leaner, is it more tender, is it, I, I literally don't know. So that's something that you need to think about too, is making sure that you're sharing the benefits, not just the features of your farm or ranch. Um, let's see. I, one other thing that I wanted to make sure that I hit, because price is important and value is important. Uh, we did a webinar with Matt LaRue from Cornell University, other side of the country, but he's, he's kind of a guru in meat pricing and meat marketing for direct-to-consumer producers. And one of the quotes that stood out to me from that is that if you have higher prices, because you need to make that equilibrium work, that can be okay, but you have to support that with more marketing and do a better job of telling your story in order to make that work. And so that's something that, like Michelle, we continue to work on resources to help farmers and butcher shops do that. And then through the CHOP Local Marketplace, we help do it on their behalf when we can. Okay, I'm sure that they have more to say uh, based on what each has said. They might have thoughts they wanna add. But I wanna throw it open to you because I think we'll get a better dialogue. And, they'll, and you guys should feel free to say anything that you've heard Throw it in when you want, okay? So let's open it to the audience. Questions? Coco, are you around? I'm going to give you this. Okay, you're there. Great. Great. So are you, uh, are you selling all 2,000 of those heads to those 400 families? And did, to do that, did you market to uh, the local Mercedes and Porsche dealership? Or how did you do that? <laughs> uh, thank you. That, that definitely needs to be clarified. No, the 2,000 animals... 95% of them are um, owned by other people, um, and they're, they're contract grazing animals, um, and that allows us to do work on the ranch, you know. Um, but our, uh, our herd of animals that we sell to 400 families is more or less 100 head a year. Um, and I, I, I may not, there are way better marker, marketers in this room, but that we have been here for 30 years and continue to do it. And actually, I get probably five emails a day. Um, and I look at my email every fifth day. So, you know, <laughs> all of them are on search engine optimization. And we have, I don't even know what that meant until, you know, Katie just clarified it now. But the relationships we have with our customers are such that 33 years ago when we started, we were at the top of the list when you Googled it. Now I don't even know where we are on the list, but our relationships are such that it, if I wanted to grow, it would matter a lot. If I don't want to grow and I just want to serve the customers we have who replace themselves, that's my, 
that's my search engine basically. We have tried to cooperate with customers and develop relationships in ways that they will support our businesses economically in ways that, um, you know, that, that, that meat bought at a, at a Safeway doesn't do. Our customers meet us halfway. They deliver our beef, basically. They store our beef. They pick up the boxes and put it in their car. Um, they tell others about our beef. You know, I mean, so our customers are, they're not only consuming, they are producers. And, and, and that, that, that's a really healthy relationship. For ranchers who are ranchers and aren't going to be primarily marketers, um, there are wonderful marketing support that wasn't there 33 years ago. Um, but there's our little model, too, that, that, that might be helpful. Um, along with the marketing, I also want to encourage folks to take the leap for opportunities. Um, the only reason why I'm really here is because I got a chance to develop a relationship with Michael of um, Roots of Change because our ranch, um, I'm just a small part of a family ranch, Hannah Brothers, and we raise Angus and commercial and we put up hay and raise bulls. And for years, our ranch never wanted to be part of the cattleman's tour, our local cattleman's tour. And when I started raising Belted Galway, I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to just practice, you know, uh, presenting my info in front of folks. And that was one of the best things I ever did. Our um, cattleman's tour takes place in August, which is horrible timing for us because we, in Scott Valley, we only have uh, probably a good three months to hay. So um, we put up about, uh, oh, um, uh, we, we only put up about three good cuttings of hay a season. So when my family said, uh, I'm sorry, you want to do this in August? And then our, our kids need to get ready for the fair and we need to do all this? Um, I said, yeah, I think I already said yes. I'm sorry, I didn't ask. We're just going to do it. So um, my brothers-in-law were great at, at helping me get set up and so forth. But it was so cool. And again, this was free. It was a pain in the butt work, but it was so cool, all of the people we met. And it wasn't just our local cattlemen and cattlewomen. It was um, folks that were in town uh, from the Bay Area. I met you know, folks from Napa that were new to the region. We met um, folks from like the Dunsmere area. Like, I was impressed at how many non-cattle folk came. And that was so cool to not only share our story, but establish those relationships um, to ask questions, to figure out how to market things, to figure out, oh man, who's going to process like my beef sticks? Um, and then from there, just get this kind of marketing. Um, I had some great photography out of that cattleman's tour. And then I made a connection with the Cattlemen's Association. And then I was in the newsletter. And then I made the magazine. And again, I'm small time. I do not have a background in marketing whatsoever. But I will hustle. I mean, if I'm on a treadmill, I will outrun you until I fall off that thing. <laughs> so it was, uh, I, I want to put that in the back of your brains that um, sometimes opportunities, though they might seem like challenges or might seem really undoable, they are magical in how things um, roll, especially like in the marketing world. Um, and if you don't have much of a marketing budget like myself, it was, uh, I can't say more, I uh, can't say enough about that. Hi guys, I have a quick question for Joe. What does the 95% of the grazing herd do for your financial bottom line? Why is it that you graze so many animals for other people? Well, it adds to the bottom line quite a bit. You know, I mean, it's contract grazing, so we get paid for every one of those animals that, that uh, stays on our ranches through the, through the winter. Uh, and they come from wintry places, Oregon, Nevada, Idaho, some from Wyoming, some from Hawaii, another wintry place, right? But the, <laughs> they come to us for the winter, and so they pay us to have their animals there and gain weight. She needs a mic, we can't hear. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought I was, I just misunderstood that I thought 
you were going out to graze other people's land with other people's animals, not that you were bringing other people's animals into your own ranch to graze. So like here in Sonoma County, a lot of people do contract grazing and they're going out with their animals and grazing for other people. Where you're doing the opposite, you're bringing other people's animals into your ranch. That's our ranch, quote unquote, um, we, we, we don't own any land. So we lease other people's land. We have other people's animals and other people's money at work in our business. And that's how we've made our, our business Thank you work. for clarifying. Say that, say that again. Here. The question was. Co -co's, yeah, okay, good. The question was, is that, is that one mob of, of animals? Um, and the answer is no. There, there's three ranches, four ranches, two are contiguous, so three ranch units that we, that we try to um, graze one mob on each ranch. And the largest herd is uh, 1,200 animals. But it's, it's, that's a different talk, really, but it's a very challenging thing because it requires infrastructure, a lot of skill, high levels of skill, and water in particular. Um, anyway, yeah. I talk to you yeah. all day about that someday. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Here's a question here, Coco, right here. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I had a question for the lady from Chop Local. Uh, how many active users do you have on your website? And how does that transition over to the people? How does that convert over to the people that are part of your organization? Yeah. So the question was how many active users on our website? You mean like customers yeah, on our so website? Yeah. So how many people using your system actually convert over to a farmer ranch to buy meat? Super good question. Um, so if you're familiar with e-commerce, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. If you're e familiar with e-commerce conversion rates, um, they are low. Somebody in the front just said they're low. They're kind of depressingly low, so I'm scared to tell you. Um, sometimes it can be as low as 1% to 3% of the people that visit your website will actually become a buyer, okay? So it's in the single digits, traditionally. It's a little bit different um, depending on if you're selling something you know, a cheap little gadget for your kids or if it's, you know, something that's more expensive like meat that they're going to be investing in. Um, I don't have a firm number for you on the number of users, but I can tell you just a little bit more about how it works is just like a traditional farmer's market, each farm or ranch has their own farmer's market booth, if you will, but it's online. So it's their own micro store, we call it, that has all of their products, shares their story, they can send their customers directly to that micro store. Um, so one of our most uh, successful vendors is a small uh, meat market. It's all frozen meat in, from Iowa Farms. All frozen, they're not cutting anything. They're getting it all done at a USDA inspected processor and bringing it into this store. Um, she has her West 40 Market website. There's a button that says shop. When she clicks shop, it goes to choplocal.com slash West 40 Market. Shows all of her products there, okay? I can tell you her conversion rate for customers that go to choplocal.com slash West 40 Market is between 5 and 7% seasonally for people that are actually purchasing. So that's something that we're really proud of. We know that that is working for her customers to make those purchases. On the other hand, customers can come to choplocal.com if they don't have a relationship already with a farm, ranch, or butcher shop. They can search for meat that meets their criteria, whether it is grass finished or it is, you know, when we talk about pork, it's pastured pork, um, never antibiotics, that type of thing. They can search for meat that way. They can look at a map and see which farms are closest to them and can ship to them. And then they can choose a farm or ranch and order that way as well. But yeah, we get um, kind of, I, I love my spreadsheets and my data, so I kind of dig into that. Um, what we work on is bringing in those new customers that don't have that relationship already. And then our vendors are also bringing their customers that already do have that relationship and they can order directly from them as well. I hope that answered your question. Hi there. <clears throat> uh, Do you help 
the producers lower the shipping costs somehow? We do, actually. So um, I mentioned we do educational trainings. Our most popular one is our shipping webinar. Um, we actually just started charging. We charge $24.99 for that training to learn how to ship your meat. Um, we actually, most of our producers do not ship using dry ice either. They're in very rural areas, which makes it hard to access dry ice. Dry ice is hard to use. It's hard for the customer if, it's, if it hasn't completely sublimated by the time that it gets there. And so um, we train our vendors on how to ship without using dry ice. And then we actually um, help subsidize that cost for them just a little bit too. We found that it helps increase the conversion rate so much when you offer free shipping that it's worth it. It's, if you look at it, Michelle mentioned earlier, your cost of customer acquisition. That is a, a customer acquisition cost when you look at it that way, and it makes a lot of sense. So, To just tag along with the cost of shipping, if any of you have any questions about uh, shipping and packaging and so forth, I'm happy to help. And I also brought some examples of uh, my um, box and, and liners. Uh, I ship with dry ice. So a lot of our... You know, Regina already has her website and her online store, and there are a lot of producers that have done that, but there are a lot of them out there that that is beyond their scope of, of technology use or comfort level, right? And so that's where we come in is we can help out for producers who haven't made it quite as far as Regina has with her online presence. Um. We... Sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one more thing is we really focus a lot on things that you can do relatively one time to really improve your online presence in your store. So social media, how many of you use social media to market? How many of you feel like it's never ending and doesn't necessarily get you results that you need? Okay, right, right. So, but there are things like writing your product descriptions or sharing your brand story to focus on the benefits, not just the features. That is a relatively one-time thing that you can do that will improve your meat sales online longer term. And it's not something that you have to wake up and do every morning and respond to messages and post another story and do another graphic and do another, right? Um, and so we really encourage that type of thing too, is to get that infrastructure for marketing in place. And one thing that I thought of when Joe mentioned earlier, he's been doing this for over 30 years. If he needs to replace a customer, it's not that hard anymore because he has such great customer advocates for him. Um, and so one of those things that you can do that is part of your marketing infrastructure really is you want to get word of mouth going, but you might have to actually ask your customers to give you a positive review so that you can share that online. And I think that that can be really powerful when you are just starting out if more of you are in the position of someone like Regina or Chop Local's been, we launched in 2020 also, so um, relatively similar time frame. Okay, sorry, Michael. I hope you didn't cover this already. Do you get access to bulk shipping rates? Or? Yes. We integrate with another platform that gives the discounted shipping rates. We, I mean, and if you have an online store somewhere else, ShipStation is the one that we recommend if you are shipping primarily ground, which is what we recommend. You know, we talk about local meat. We, we push customers to be purchasing from someone that can ship to them ground. Um, if you are shipping air, there are a couple other platforms that will get you better rates on air versus ground. But it's all in my shipping training for $24.99 at choplocaluniversity.com. Joe, I have a question for you. Um, you. I mean, you deliver meat in a certain way. I think you should describe that to people because it's a completely different model. It works for you. How did you actually... Um, organize that over time and, and give us a, a sense of the pace at which you were able to develop that. Because 33 years or 35 years is a long time. I wonder how many people in this room are willing to do that. So why don't you describe it? Yeah, so we, we stumbled into this um, because of necessity, which breeds creativity. Uh, and um, it, it ha it was, I think it was 2001, 2002, there was a... Uh, uh, BSE, mad cow disease outbreak on the Canadian border, and it affected all the rules by which meat 
goes from the ranch to the to the to the customer we were no longer able to do some of the things we did so we had to find a USDA inspected um, cut and wrap facility um, that was also a cut and was a slaughter facility that happened to be in Orland California it was Johansson's uh, beef and we we talked to them and we were able to we were able to to, to work with them they had space we got in there we got kill dates and so forth but then we had to figure out how to get the meat to our customers so we um, we decided that we would we would try to deliver and so we put up on our website in those days I think it was an email thing where we would have these dates when we would pick up from the butcher frozen meat in a box is put them in a reefer truck and come south and as we came south we arranged lo drop-off locations where we would meet customers for some window of time the customers would be there we would be there we would put boxes in their uh, trunk of their car and they would go on their way um, that's still what we do and 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 we put our dates and locations up you know early late January when we have the whole year mapped out and uh, we give customers that window in maybe 15 minutes and we meet customers between the butcher where we pick the meat up frozen and by the time we get home we have an empty truck and a lot of cash in the bank how many stops do you have how many sites are you meeting people that's something we've learned to manage um, we started off and we would we would still have those windows of time but we would have like seven or eight drop-off locations which doesn't sound like too much over the course of a day but it is insane because between those seven stops there's 40 million people you're competing with driving space in California and it is exceedingly challenging to make sure you're you meet your windows now we we don't we don't do that and, and we've actually figured out where our customers are anyway you know with the simple reports from we use Gray's cart which is another online marketing um, platform and that's helped us kind of understand okay we have 90 percent or 60 percent of our customers in this area so we make sure we go there every time we pick, pick beat up but there's other areas that we have 10% of our customers and so we give them two times a year and so we we've we've made the drop-off locations fewer the windows are the same but it's a completely sane and fairly relaxed day um, even though the logistics are pretty considerable but they're they're totally doable now did you buy your own truck do you have your own um, no we don't we rent trucks from uh, monarch truck in San Jose and they have high quality trucks they're maintained well there's an expense there but I don't have to maintain license etc a truck and Regina tell them about your next door thing because you do drop-offs but you have customers that use next door to oh um well I do drop-offs a variety uh, I would say probably quarterly in the Bay Area, in Oakland, and in Palo Alto. But those are really tied into my social schedule. Um, it was a great way to get an excuse to go see some of my besties from college. And from that, it's kind of really grown. And so it's been a really neat way to um, meet and spend some time with our customers. So what happens is um, when I go to Palo Alto a couple times a year to see my bestie, um, who is a vegetarian, but she has uh, raised her kids like coming up to the ranch and she has seen how we do things, um, she'll put it on her next door um, or her local Facebook group. And then same thing for my friends in Oakland and then my friends in Marin are starting to do that. And so folks find out when I'm coming down in, uh, into the area, they'll go online and they'll order and then I just bring it down. I haul down a bunch of coolers in the back of a pickup, and then it's great. Uh, for some folks, I do drop off, um, and that's been uh, a great way, too, to get to know people, like, where they're living and so forth, and just kind of have that uh, input of data, like, in the back of my head, and um, as far as, like, how to approach people. 
and how to get people their beef, but it's been such a, a remarkable and enjoyable experience just having my friends not realizing that some, they are some of my best advocates um, and having that opportunity. Um, which reminds me that also don't forget about your local folks. Uh, in Siskiyou County, where I'm from up north, it's not the best as far as like social economics. And so when I, get, when I got started, I did get a little bit of criticism from some folks about like, man, your beef is awfully expensive. I said, well, uh, you know, this is the cost of me doing business. And I was a little worried uh, when I first got started, but I would say as I've grown and made relationships, 25% of my business is local from Siskiyou County. So, and I have folks from all different walks of life that have um, become introduced and appreciated local beef. Like I have a, um, a customer and she has a, a lot of foster kids and she loves our ground beef. Um, she's based in Weed, California and she was like, once I touch your ground beef, I can never go back to buying ground beef in the store. It's just not the same consistency. It's not the same kind of quality. You know, when I, I form, form those into hamburger patties. So I want to just remind you, don't forget that sometimes some of your best and loyal customers are right there in your back door, regardless of, of you know, you worry that it might be too high for them or whatever. They are supporting you. They are supporting their local economy. They are... Um, at ease with the idea of knowing like at this point in my life this is the best high quality protein I can get from my family and I just get it from the gal in Scott Valley. Cool. Here's a question. Uh, for the guy from Morris Cattle, I, sorry I'm bad with names, uh, Joe, uh, you said something graze card or graze cart, could you elaborate on that? Yes, um, graze cart. Uh, is an online marketing platform. It's run by Seven Sons Farms in Ohio. Indiana. Indiana. Thank you. <laughs> Katie probably knows more about it than I do, but um, they also do their marketing, and, and they've got seven sons, some of whom are pretty good with computers, and they've developed these uh, um, these marketing platforms that, that support producers attempts to create relationships and, and lo manage logistics of those relationships with their customers. And it's, it's, it's been outstanding for us, yeah. It, it makes it, our customers, we have an account with them, our customers go to their website through our website and uh, they, that's where they can put in their orders, uh, um, decide where they want to pick up and and um, all the products that they want. We sell in quarters, halves, and holes. We, we call them split halves because it's a different way of having a quarter, but I think everybody probably knows what that is, the, the split half is. Uh, and then we, we, we offer only very few products. Um, we offer the, the, the off-haul and the extras separate from the meat because not everybody wants it, and um, in some ways you could argue it would be great to bundle it because then you sell the, the liver for twelve fifty a pound, but not all of our customers want that. So we thought, well, that gross price is going to be really sticker shock if they have to buy another 10 pounds of offal that they really don't want. Uh, and bones, I see some people put bones in and it's like, wow, that's, uh, people like bones, but not for twelve fifty a pound. So anyway, that's how we do it. Grace Card supports that, and um, it's, an, it's a good option. So I, how many people who are in the audience who are producers are actually thinking about pursuing this, development of their own brand? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flip the question. Um, if, you're, if, if you were talking to someone about that, what would you tell them is the hardest thing that you had to do to make it work? Hold on one second. How many of you guys are doing like the split halves, halves, and holes? Okay, and how many are doing retail cuts? Okay, so pretty split. All right, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. 
So, the Regina, hardest. what's the hardest thing? What is the thing that gives you the, like, when you wake up in the middle of the night, like, Jesus, I got to deal with this. What is it? Oh, man. Butt in the seat. Time in equals time out. So, sitting in front of a computer screen, working on your website, planning for your newsletter, and having that be consistent is huge. So that is the biggest thing that I, um, I dread and I thrive off of. Um, I do, I'm not the kind of person that uh, enjoys being behind a computer screen for hours at a time. I find it dreadful. But I have really learned that if you put the time in to plan your content creation on your social media, to plan an authentic newsletter and spend time doing that and being consistent with that, you will retain your loyal customers where, like right now where I'm at, uh, that has been hugely impo important, like retaining the people I have that have been with me from the beginning because I'm, I'm still small time and I find that um, it's one thing to, you know, try to encourage like new customers and so forth, but I really think that um, it's very important to retain uh, the people that you have and, and growing that base because they'll, be, they'll end up being your ve best um, advocates. But time in equals time out. And as a mom, I still have a town job too, and then I run cattle um, with my family. You just have to block out the time. And I'm not here to say that you're gonna find a balance. You're not. I don't believe in that. Um, if you get a balance, then I think you're stagnant and then you don't grow. You don't learn. Or sometimes you're forced with challenges to like, oh damn, you know, the processor that I go to is closed down. So now I gotta hustle and figure out, okay, I'm gonna have to sell some shares of uh, some beef that I have um, ready to be produced by a local butcher. How am I gonna do that? You have to pivot. So I am here to say that Time in equals time out. And you're, it's... Good. I'd like to say it's great, like, oh, you know, I schedule an hour a day. But I find that if, if it's like, um, you know, I have four hours and I, uh, I'm going to go to bed late or whatever, I, I get my best work, uninterrupted work. So it just grab the time when you can. Good. Can I pitch in there? I, um, I, I agree with Re Regina. That, that 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 aspect of this whole thing is 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 one of the most challenging. The sitting at the computer, making sure your website is right, maintaining those those customer relationships and things. But I I, I want to offer a different take on the time in it equals time out. It doesn't always. <laughs> you can put a lot of time in, and the price you get paid for that time is extremely low. Can be. And so I, I, would, I would caution anybody who's interested in, in doing this marketing thing to really think it through and, and to take advantage. I mean, at this point, there are lots, maybe not lots, but there are people like Katie and other things. Yes, yeah, yeah oh, there's a lot of support and ways of doing this marketing that, is, um, that requires much, much less time than other ways. And you have to think about your own context because I'm, I'm, I'm not always an advocate for direct marketing. I'm always an advocate for good decision making, holistic decision making. That is what will, that is what will make sure you are moving towards where you wanna go. Um, I see a lot of people get into direct marketing and then they're also doing, they're trying to get all these other products not only the meat, they're doing beef sticks, jerky, all of which is wonderful, all of which there's a market for, not all of which is going to pay you to do equally. So you got to really test those different decisions very thoroughly um, to make sure that Regina's point, time in, does equal time out or more. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. I agree. I mean, there are things that you you have to do, right? There, you. It's not just going to happen by magic. And I think there. Um, I was just reading about the phases of the entrepreneurial journey, and there is this optimism at the beginning, and then you realize that there's a little bit more work involved than you thought, right? 
And that can be disheartening. And that's where I would encourage you to turn to organizations like the Good Meat Project or Chop Local University to find out what has worked from other people. You guys are already doing a great job by coming to a conference like this to learn from successful ranchers that have been selling direct to consumer. The other part that I find challenging, and this could be because it's just not my wheelhouse, but it's something that producers talk to me about, um, and I, I honestly don't have resources or very good resources on this, is really knowing your cost of production and your margins and what you do need to be pricing for in order to make it work. And, you know, Joe's taken years to figure out that his initial delivery schedule was not working, but he's figured out how to make that better. Um, I see producers that are doing a lot of things like delivering directly to consumers or carrying a bunch of different products in their inventory when maybe some of them aren't selling and that type of thing. And I guess I really encourage you to look at that. I love what Joe said about making smart decisions because that's really important. Um, and I would say, you all know how important it is to have a great processor as a partner, but look to these other organizations that can be partners with you to help you, to get you through that overwhelm, to get you th over that learning curve and help you make a little bit faster progress than maybe the people before you did. So uh, we're just about out of time. So I just want to offer a couple of thoughts. This has been very interesting. Um, as you know, our team, uh, by the way, uh, Coco, Doris, Patrick, Courtney, could you all stand up? So just, I just want to make sure you all know who they are. Uh, also, uh, Patrick Mulvaney, chef, who hosted our last events here. Say hi to him. Yeah. Santana Diaz, who was actually a dinner at Mulvaney's two years ago. There he is right there. Uh, really set all of this off because we talked to him for a long time one night, drank some wine, had a great conversation, and it's, it, it led to all of this stuff. So there's a lot of the pioneers here. I just want everybody to see them. Um, what? I know, I know. I, I, I'm going to say some things that, are, that might be a little bit controversial, but we have, um, because I want to just spice it up a little bit. Um, oh, yeah. Michelle, go ahead. Can I just say one thing? I want to offer two things because Katie made a great point about local and also Regina made a great point about local. And the one thing, two things you can do that you only have to do once, meta descriptions, talk to me or Katie about that. You only have to do it once and it really helps with local search engine optimization. And, and your Google business profile. Were you going to say that one? That was the second one. Oh, sorry. Do okay. your Google <laughs> business profile. It's free. It really helps with local people finding your business. You only have to do it once. It'll like, take you a few minutes. Seconds. Michelle and I can help you do it yeah. tonight. Like, On your phone. It. It's so easy. Yes. Okay, great. That's it. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Another great, great reason why you came right there. Boom. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate it. So, um, you know, when we, some of you may remember uh, the last event we did in June, um, which uh, was a really important event for us to kind of understand things. And we got a lot of feedback from all of you. And about the same time, a bunch of well-established brands in the state of California were going out of business. Do you all remember that? Going for a brand is a huge thing, a huge thing. 33 years, four years, um, it is a big decision. And if you feel like you can't do that, there are established brands that need animals. As was pointed out, this is a low point. One of the fears that our team has right now is that there are so few cattle out there, we're gonna lose the brands we have if those brands don't get more cattle. It's something to think about. The market goes up and down. And we're in a period right now where prices are super crazy. There's not enough cattle. The big processors in the Midwest have made a commitment to buy all the cattle they can to put everybody out of business so they continue to hold the market. That is a reality. They want to kill the small processors, and they want to kill the small producers. They want to own it. 
So the question is, strategically, is this the moment for me to start my own brand? I think it's a great idea. And there are people in this room, I'm sure, who have the skills and the perseverance and the capital or the relationships. Because one of the things I heard was relationships. Building of relationships, leveraging relationships, commitment to relationships. That takes time. So one of the questions is, is this the moment? Is this the moment? I just wanted to throw that out there. Anybody have any comments or want to argue about that? Stand up. I want Seriously. to say one thing, Michael, related to this and what Rebecca talked about, about processors not being able to fill spots, you know, or being under capacity. For the processors in the room, I know from talking to them the last couple of years that marketing has not necessarily been a priority because you had producers coming to you booking, and maybe it's different here, but, you know, booking out a year and a half to two years in advance, and now if that's drying up, you're going, wait, okay, what do I do? Some of the same things that we talked about today about sharing your story and talking about the benefits and doing these one-time things like a website update, it is time for you to do those things to help you bring more of those producers in the door, okay? Um, you may, and I say you as if they're all here listening to me, but um, they, our processors may not have had to pay much attention to that in the past. They may need to start doing that now. And again, there are resources out there to help. Um, and a lot of these things are one-time investments. It doesn't necessarily have to be ongoing social media all the time, but maybe it's creating a website that answers a lot of questions and decreases the time that your staff has to spend on the phone answering questions. Or maybe it's gathering those customer reviews. Rebecca talked about these, uh, these relationships between processors and producers, and producers are nervous when they send in an animal that's worth you know, a couple thousand, several thousand dollars, they want to make sure that they're going to get a good product back. And having those customer reviews, just like we talked about for the farms and ranches, is really important for the processors too. So if you have questions about that or thoughts about that, I know um, that's something that Rebecca and Michelle and I would be happy to talk to you about as well. So Great. Good. Thank you. So uh, we have two minutes. So I want to give them each one minute uh, to close. We're going to we can end a little early because I'm going to be around here all day and one-on-one -on -one conversation works really well. I just want to point out, after lunch, we're going to hear from two other large established brands. We're going to have a conversation really about regenerative agriculture but and re regenerative ranching, but we're going to hear from them about their own brands too. So we're going to hear a, diff a little bit different stories here after lunch. So with that, closing comments about one minute each, please. Um, I'm living proof that if you're willing to jump, jump out there um, to sell beef, uh, my staff consider, uh, it consists of a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, and sometimes they eat me out of snacks and time. And then my husband, thankfully, who has a, a background in ranching, um, has helped me out a lot. But uh, I'm living proof of it. You know, we hustle. We still have land payments. You know, we haven't had anything handed to us, and I'm still self-funded. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to help. Um, again, reach out to those resources. Um, Katie talked about it, too. I, you name it, I've done it. The webinar, um, handouts, uh, asking folks, whatever. I'm not shy about uh, getting that information because it will help you um, in the long run, especially making those relationships. So... Don't be shy. Okay, one minute. Um, my staff is here, Sydney. This is, we are a very small team, CHOP Local. The only reason that we can do this is because we have other ancillary team members like Rebecca or people that we rely on for more information. So CHOP Local University on Facebook, Instagram, choplocaluniversity.com. Sign up for our email list, please. You'll get a ton of information right off the bat. You'll get an automated email sequence that points you to some of our most popular resources. So I definitely recommend that. And we will be here all day. We'll be happy to answer questions or talk through anything that you want to go deeper into. I think what ranchers are doing out on the land is of such value um, that it lends itself to creating relationships between people in town 
and people on the land. And I think it, I think it, um, there's a lot of ways to, 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 to create those relationships. Some are very close, some are less, less close, more tenuous. Um, but I think if you're, a, if you're a rancher and you kind of look at the inventory that you have in your animals, there are opportunities because some of your animals are, are relatively low value. And I think if you design your marketing scheme correctly, um, it, it, it can add a lot of value to your, your, it can add some stability to your economics, it can add some value to your, to your economics, um, and, it, and it can be fun. That's not a foregone conclusion. So make your decisions carefully, design it so that it serves your purpose, and, um, and create more relationships between people in the city and people on the land. It, it needs to happen. This is a great place. I mean, we, it's just such a beautiful thing that we do in, in, if we do it well. And um, I think there's real opportunity. Thank you very much. Let's thank our panel. Great job. Nice panel. So I just want to make a quick announcement. Um, we're going to have fajitas, actually. Uh, and that meat is from Richard's Regenerative. Uh, fajitas. Um, so we're going to have fajitas for lunch. Uh, and then we, so enjoy the lunch. Take a break. And um, I'm going to hand it to Rebecca Thistlethwaite. She has an important thing to say. Oh, I just, I just wanted to announce that the USDA grants just were uh, announced today, and three awards are being made in California. So Five Marys, uh, Bud's Custom Meats, and Redwood Meats are all getting a very large grant. So yay! <laughs> Exciting. So that's the Siskiyou County? Uh, Bud's right here, Sonoma County, and uh, on the Cumboldt Coast. So that's great news. Great. Thank you. Lunchtime. What the afternoon is going to look like to remind you is we're going to spend a few minutes at, at, at the uh, beginning here uh, and uh, talk about um, the information uh, website platform that is being developed as part of this project. Um, after that, we'll move into our third panel that will be uh, discussing uh, regenerative production uh, by a couple of the larger brands that are around. And then, what? Oh yes, and CDFA, and uh, then um, we will move after that into our speed dating that Coco is going to explain to us. Uh, before we launch into that, I just want to say hello to Paul Will Williams in the back uh, from the University of California Office of the President uh, Procurement Team, still here, still engaged and excited to uh, bring the kind of, me of meat you're producing into the UC system. So. Um, <clears throat> Let's just start off talking about information for a minute. Um, we have all these people in here. Part of the speed dating that's going on is trying to figure out who has what, who needs what. Um, this will be a lot easier if we have some sort of online platform to be able to uh, understand what the, the meat system in Northern California looks like and uh, what the different components are. So uh, IC Foods is taking the lead with UC Davis help in putting together um, a portal uh, for Northern California meat um, and uh, right now we have kind of a demo website but Courtney's going to take us through it and um, over the next few months we'll be uh, bringing that live onto the uh, IC Foods uh, website but I will let Courtney take it from here. Thanks Patrick and welcome everyone. Hope you all had a nice lunch. Uh, so I, what I'm going to go through in a minute, we have a prototype up. And this is just going to be a really speed cameo to show some of the information that we have there. And then uh, it will be engaging with all of you, you know, over the next couple months to make sure that, that what, we're, what we're putting together is something that people actually want and need. And just as a little background, I think we missed that this morning. So um, 
my organization, IC Foods, is a nonprofit that actually we spun out of UC Davis a few years ago. And our whole mission is to make uh, the food system work for more people. So to make more actors in the food system and more foods in the food system. And so, you know, this kind of a project is exactly what we're about. So putting together resources that that help people and make um, and make these, uh, especially the local and regional scale pieces, work better. Um, so on that, just giving you, again, a really quick cameo of the kinds of things that we're um, putting together for this group of people and this project. Patrick, if you could just show the first slide. This is a, a snapshot of what the page currently looks like. Um, very specific to this group. On the top, uh, there's right now is, is what we have planned out. There's a tab about regenerative agriculture and what it actually means. And I'll go through these in detail in a second. Resources is gonna be um, all the resources that are available, like the people we've had coming to talk today, different grant programs. Um, the businesses is the part that's probably the most exciting for people. That's really the list of who's doing what at a whole bunch of different parts of the, the system. And then uh, just a media will be like, um, you know, different, different things that are out there for people. So if you hit the next slide, Patrick. Um, so this is what's down, the resources that are under there, um, what's planned right now, just as an idea, who are the people that are providing expertise, what are the funding opportunities, the California Jobs First program that our group has spent a lot of time talking about trying to get, um, well in this group uh, quite a few people have been engaged in that, trying to get some of the state money that's available, focusing into building some of the um, infrastructure for, for the meat system in our regions. Um, and so we've been tracking that pretty closely. Different certifications that um, are in process, that people are participating in, that is um, appropriate for this group. And then, actually, I think uh, one more tab that we'll probably add under here as I'm thinking about it is, is resources. Is what, are, what are a lot of these marketing resources that people are using to actually get their product out? So that'll be added here. Just notice we're missing that. Um, so that, that's you know, just kind of the snapshot of the kinds of things that'll go under that section. Um, if you, in the next one, yeah, the businesses, so catalogs of who everyone is. And right now, what we have is a pretty extensive list of all of the public registries of this information. So we've pulled all, um, uh, 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 the people participating in this project um, have shared their information and, and will actually want to, to help make that ex uh, accessible for um, for people to, act, to contact each other directly. But right now, what we have in here is just a, a registry of all of the permitted processors, all the permitted uh, slaughterhouses, and it's just in a one-stop shop. And from experience, that's really hard to find. We spent uh, that whole first project pulling that information together. And uh, anyway, it's there. Um, the producers, different kinds of producers. Um, and then the buyer's piece is, of course, going to be ongoing. but. Right now, that is just what our team has put together of, you know, what markets, what businesses, what butchers are actually advertising that they're buying local and regenerative. And so that was that was some grunt work by our team to start pulling that together. But these are uh, meant to be first a snapshot, but then um, a living directory that'll grow and, and update over time. And, and we can talk about ways to make that happen because, of course, as soon as you put a list together, it's out of date. So we'll be, you know, working with, with the group and, and also maybe with some... Um, technology tools to make that work a little better. Anyway, that's, that's the uh, business section. And then the next slide, uh, some examples of some of the businesses that are in there now. And this is a screenshot. It's not the live map, but it actually scrolls to the right. And it has more information that has uh, you know, several more fields of information. And, and we can, um, of course, update that and add different fields. But, but uh, it's just an example of, and I think there's, I don't know, about 300 producers in this list right now. Um, a map of where all these people are in the state. Of course, you can zoom in and click on who the entities are. And then, uh, and then just you know, some of the media pieces and reports that will be available. So um, again, this is meant to be just a really quick snapshot of the pieces we're putting together that will be available. Um, if you, and, uh, and over the next period, we'll be wanting to engage with the group and get your feedback on you know, what, what really needs to be in here, what are we missing, is this the best way to present it? And so just look to hear from us. We'll you know, put together some, some conversations about that going forward. And then the other piece I just want to mention today is for everyone that's here today, um, we'd like to, to make 
of course, we'll, we'll add you to our newsletter, but we'd like to uh, make it possible. People have been asking to share information among this group, and so we're planning to do that. If you registered under somebody else's email and want to change it, let us know. If you really don't want to be sharing with this group, let us know, and we'll pull you off the list. But uh, hoping to make it easier for people to connect, um, starting with this group, but then also the, the other folks that have been participating that couldn't join today. So um, that's really, really what we had. We just want to do a really quick snapshot on the information platform, how it's coming together. And if, uh, if there's any you know, immediate thoughts about about this, yeah, happy to take questions. Um, if not, we can we can get into the kind of more discussion topics, but definitely we'll be coming back to you uh, for input on this um, going forward. Thoughts or questions? Does it look useful? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Oh, well, so she asked for my organization. We started as a grant-funded research project as an incubator uh, organization, always intending to, to become independent. Our, we're very technical, our full name. We go by IC Foods because people can say it, but it's International Center for Food, Ontology, Operability, Data, and Semastics. So we do a lot of the computer science stuff too. We don't talk about that with real people. Um, <laughs> but we also work a lot with uh, real people, real food systems, real supply chains, trying to find information tools um, to make things work better. Um, yeah. Great. Shall we? Yeah, thanks. And again, um, we really want your input on how to make this useful and you know, keeping it alive once it goes forward. We'll talk a, a little bit more later, but we do have another kind of follow-on project that's related. So we have a few more years duration to keep this going that's already kind of um, funded by another grant project. So it, it, you know, it's not end of the grant, end of the, end of the process, but um, you know, I guess if it's not functional and useful at the end of five years, then, then it doesn't meant to be anyway. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, so And I see foods. Um, so uh, let's bring up our next panel. This is the panel that we're gonna talk about regenerative agriculture. So we have Kerry Richards, uh, we have Virginia Jameson, and we have Lauren Poncha all coming up here. We're gonna have um, hopefully a spirited conversation. That's the kind I like, a little spicy. You know, I like it when people disagree. They do it with respect because then, you know, we, um, we learn more. So uh, the way we're going to start is we're going to actually have just the first two ranchers and then, and then Virginia uh, from the California Department of Food and Ag um, uh, tell each of them is going to describe what they do, what they're currently doing. Then we're going to talk about what their definitions of regenerative, and we're going to talk about the state's process, uh, and then we're going to open it to you. So let's start with Carrie. <laughs> text, test, test. Test, test, test. Oh, there here we go. go. Wait, what am I supposed to do first? That you, was a lot uh, of things. Just describe your operation, okay. where you are, what you do. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to start with my origin story. Um, so. Basically, my family has a ranch in Yuba County. Uh, I'm the fourth generation, along with my brother and sister who are here today. Um, my children will be the fifth generation. Um, we've ranched, you know, commercially. We've done cow-calf. We've done purebreds. We've done a little bit of everything. And um, basically, in about 2012, I started getting really involved in the ranch. The cattle market was not very good. We kind of were having those discussions of what we're doing, what's the next thing for our property. And I was getting really into pastured meats and eating healthy, and we decided to sell um, holes and halves locally to friends and family. And that is when the brand story begins because we started Richard's Grass-Fed Beef in 2012 and it was just nine head of cattle, holes and halves to family and friends. We got American Grass-Fed certified. I cold called a lot of people in this room because I really was you know, trying to figure out how we can finish year round on uh, grass that is not irrigated in California. 
and um, I learned a lot. And what we realize is there is a market out there for grass-fed beef. There's a lot of people that want to eat healthy. There's a lot of people that want to know where their meat is coming from. So we, uh, my husband and I moved from Oakland up to the family ranch and took over. And um, that is where the brand story begins because I didn't know what I was doing. I thought I did. And I got there and, you know, I finished animals on green grass. I did all the things that you're not supposed to do. And I found holistic management. And holistic management basically helped me figure out how to put a plan together, how to work with the seasons, how to work with the soil, how to work with seasonality of California. And we started Richard's Grass-Fed Beef, we started selling to restaurants and wholesale, and now where we are is our brand is Richard's Regenerative. Uh, we sell almost exclusively through Cream Co. Meats, who is here. And um, we're just growing that program. Um, it's a whole animal program and we've really simplified our business, and it's a good program, and I feel like I've said enough. <laughs> Great, good, good start, very good start. Thank you, Carrie. So Lauren, you wanna go? Yep. Test, test, yep, yep. I think it's on. Yeah, it's on, it's on, you're on. I'm Lauren. I'm a uh, rancher at Stemple Creek Ranch, which is, this is kind of our home base. This is our backyard where we're at. I live about two miles across the street, and my warehouse is about 200 yards over this fence, so I feel like I didn't, I, I had the least amount of miles traveled today to be here. Um, uh, so I'm a fourth generation rancher here in Marin County. My great grandfather immigrated from Garzano, Italy in 1897, just to raise food for the Bay Area. And what's pretty wild is it's kind of, uh, there's been a renaissance in agriculture and um, what he started to do, you know, over 120 years ago, went away in the middle of the century and now it's back where people want to buy food from their local, um, local producers. So <clears throat> about 15 years ago, I was working in uh, corporate America, selling veterinary pharmaceuticals, the exact opposite of what I'm doing now. And I couldn't stop thinking about the ranch, how I could figure out a way to come back and make it work. And my wife and I moved back over here. We started the name Stemple Creek Ranch. We bought all of my parents' cattle. We leased all their land. And we said, hey, we want to do this on our own. And they said, okay. So they retired. We started Stemple Creek Ranch slowly but surely. Um, we've done everything the hard way and we've made tons and tons of mistakes, but we've gained momentum every single year. Our, our whole um, ethos has been go slow to go fast. And um, that's gotten us to now we're a well-recognized brand in the Bay Area. And we sell beef, lamb, and pork direct to consumers, to grocery stores, and to restaurants all over the place. And we will talk more about it, but with, when it comes to regenerative, we kind of use the analogy of like we want to dance with Mother Nature. And the soil and Mother Nature and biodiversity are like core pillars of our business. And we don't really care if we raise a whole bunch of meat and it's not raised the way that's dancing with Mother Nature. So we'll talk more about that Great. when we get into that. Good start, Lauren. Thanks. Okay, Virginia. Hi, I'm Virginia Jameson. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Climate and Working Lands at the California Department of Food and Ag. And my origin story, I guess, um, is coming from an agricultural conservation background. I'm working for the American Farm Land Trust, a local land trust in Salinas, California, um, and then the State of California Department of Conservation um, managing those grant programs. And I was appointed by the governor in 2001 to this position, um, which has broad oversight over California and the Department of Food and Ag's um, climate change strategy. And and so that involves um, develop, developing, implementing, uh, managing all of CDFA's climate-related programs and doing a lot of interagency work, coordinating with other agencies on what they're doing that has an effect on ag, um, which is a lot. So um, I'll leave it there. Great. How many people were with us in June? Great. Okay. At that event, we had a lot of the agency people. We had... You all from CDFA, we had the Department of Natural Resources Department, we had labor, because I just want to say this, I mean, I spent a lot of my time trying to change what government does, um, or make it better for producers and, and farmers, but I have to say that this state has done more in this space around um, the climate of any government 
in the country, I believe, if not the world. So it is, we are lucky. There are a lot of great programs. How many people have used the Healthy Soils program in this room? Great. How many have used the uh, SWEEP program? The, what is it, how do you say, what SWEEP stand for again? There's something about water. State, State Water Efficiency Enhancement Program. Yeah, how many people have used the SWEEP program? Good, okay, great. Those are two great, and then there's the Alternative Manure Management Program particularly for dairies. I mean, those are amazing programs. So I just want to say we wanted CDFA to be here because they're on to the next thing now, and we're going to get to that, um, which is what do we mean by regenerative? They're going to define it in law. So that's, that's a big deal, man. Everyone's freaking out that I know. So anyway, um, Lauren, you want to start? You, start? you started to get honest, so get into it. Sure, I'll start. Um, so I actually have a couple slides because I'm not a big slide guy and I put these together so you'll see it's not very competent, but it really helps to define what re regenerative is. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so what I consider regenerative is following the six principles of soil health. We're basically trying to get above ground biomass and below ground biomass and life, and then we harvest it with our animals. Um, we also want to create a habitat that's super friendly for everything, not just for our cattle. And then go to the next slide, please. There's just three little quick slides. Um, but this is what's regenerative agriculture, and I, I have to be honest, it's not uh, all my doing. This comes from the generations before me. The top picture is our creek, Stemple Creek, out my parents' uh, window of their house, and that's in 1991. So if you look, it was heavily denuded, the water would turn turn bright green in September, um, there, the fish would die. And then uh, around 1991, we started fencing off the creeks, planting trees. And now you look at it today, this is actually an old picture from five years ago. It looks just as good or better than this now. There's now 50 ty 55 types of migratory birds that nest here. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff, both good and bad biodiversity that lives here with us now. When I say bad, it's bad for me as a sheep farmer. There's coyotes and other critters that love to eat sheep. But as, as far as an outdoorsman and a hunter and fisherman and a hunter-gatherer, this is like epic for me. And the next step is going to be beavers are coming. I don't know if anybody from the beaver community is here. Love but beavers. Beavers are going to come. They're going to eat all those trees. They're going to turn all this into amazing wetland. We're going to have so many ducks to hunt or to harvest. And uh, um, the creek is going to flow year-round. Again, because there'll be beaver dams all the way up and down the creek. And uh, um, the steelhead and the salmon will return. And so that's, this is kind of what I consider regenerative agriculture. I don't think there's any other slides after that, but go to the next one. Yeah, so the result obviously is healthy landscape, healthy animals, healthy farms, and healthy consumers. And um, we're doing the dance with Mother Nature to try and make that happen every day. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. All right, Carrie, you're up. I think I only brought one slide. Um, so for us, these are all, this definition is tough because for me, soil health is the core to where, why I ranch the way I do. Um, we want to work with Mother Nature. We want to move those animals quickly in the fast growing season. We want to slow down in the slow growing season. Um, we don't have irrigation at our property, so we finish animals basically through July, and then we ship animals off to either irrigated pastures or other areas of California where the grass season is just starting. So with our program to grow our herds, instead of bringing in inputs, I found more leases either in Northern California or Southern California so that we can have animals on the best feed at all times of year. Obviously, in you know very wet times of year, we do have to feed. Um, grasses, but we are American grass-fed certified, so it's only grass and forage. And um, what we've seen at our ranch, this is a, a pasture that traditionally we would leave animals on the entire summer, and by September it was just cow pies, dirt, and flies. And this is obviously at the prime time of growing season. This is in about May when we were hosting an event, actually with the CDFA, and um, calf in our program that we sell into the school program. So this is our tour. Beef uh, Institution. It's called Beef Institution, Institution, and it's a big group of people. Santana's a big part of it. And we're selling our products, um, the grinds, 
and roasts into UC school system, the UC hospitals, and then lots, I think over 30 school districts across California. So we've really grown our program, which is why I've taken on more leases and taken on more cattle. And I want to work with people that are ranching in the way that we also feel like is the highest priority, which is regeneratively and holistically. All of our leases are EOV certified through land to market. Um, and that basically means it's monitored every year and they, we take in all of that data and everybody uses that data to then make management decisions that are going to be beneficial for their property. Did I beautiful. answer the question? That was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now we're going to hear what the state process is and how you're going to get to a definition. Yeah. So I think I should probably start with the why we're doing this part. Um, it wasn't in my plan for me personally to do this. Um, but what happened was we had a stakeholder visioning process that started in 2001. And this is a, a process leading to the creation of a document called Ag Vision. Um, and this was Ag Vision for the next decade. Um, it was finally published in 2023. States things take a while. Um, and so as a part of that process, which was um, a uh, you know, massive group of agricultural stakeholders, farmers, ranchers, processors, packers, shippers. Advocates. Advocates, <laughs> thank you. Um, um, and you were probably part of this, um, identified as the number one priority for the state's ag vision as fostering a climate smart, re um, resilient, regenerative food system. I wanted to get the wording right. Um, and so, in that document, the state board said, okay, like here's the, what the, the ag community wants, um, but we don't know what regenerative means, so we're going to have to undertake that process at some point. Um, that was then expedited by another state agency, totally unrelated to food and ag, um, using the term in one of their programs, which kind of lit the fire under our butts to say like, okay, if we don't want this to be set for us, um, then we're going to have to to tackle it, and so that um, started a process of the state board working with our science advisory panel to create a framework definition, um, and I can run through that one real quick because what they came up with um, was a starting point, and that starting point was to. Um, create a definition that's um, applicable, relevant, and useful to California agriculture. So keep in mind, this is a definition that has to apply to 400 crops, um, including dairy, like everything all across the state. So um, they also wanted part of the framework to be that there would be positive impacts on California's environmental, social, and economic goals, including climate goals, and that they, they would be provided um, measurable and verifiable impacts, and that um, the definition would allow for context-specific outcomes in terms of scale, geographic location, um, the diversity of farming systems, um, and includes the idea that building soil health is a fundamental element of what we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, that that's the science advisory panel framework. They sent that list back to the State Board of Food and Agriculture um, in uh, early 2022, early 2022, early 2023, sorry. Um, and then that set off a series of listening sessions. Um, so now we've done three public listening sessions. Um, Carrie was part of one of them. Um, Michael's been in all, many. Some of them, most of them. Um, we've also established a work group, and the work group is intended to actually draft a definition. Um, that work group consists of um, farmers and ranchers, academics, uh, technical assistance providers. Um, and then we're also about to start our tribal govern government to government process. Um, and so all of these different um, buckets of information gathering will then be brought together. Um, the work group will put together a draft definition and that will go to the State Board of Food and Ag um, to do with it what they will, but ultimately to make a recommendation to Secretary Ross. So um, it's a little hard to tell what the timeline will be, but I'm personally hoping for this to be finished by the end of the summer. Um, 
the tribal consultation is at least 45 days and then some more workshops after that. So anyway, it, it's a little hard to predict, but that's where we're headed. Um, so, so far, some of the major things that have come up during workshops are um, uh, kind of a tension between is this going to be an organic as the baseline um, definition or is it going to be um, something else, conventional as a baseline? Um, there's also a push and pull between um, broad versus specific. Like, do we want to have um, a long list of exact things that we mean when we say that? Or do we want there to be kind of like a broad principle that um, then maybe through, you know, ultimately state programs, like if we're funding a grant, then we'd say, okay, you have to show it by being X, 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 Y, you know, like, um, so yeah, that's where we are so far. It's, um, having watched this process, I keep thinking about it's democracy at work and it is a freaking mess <laughs> in the sense that um, it is like uh, sausage making, right? It is like all these people have to come into agreement. The meeting where the advisory panel met for the first time that's going to make the recommendation to the board. Um, you could see the tension in the room between those who think it has to be organic and those who think it needs to be broader. So it's like, an, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a lot of respect for what you're going to be writing. It's like a rodeo, man. It's going to be freaking crazy. It's gonna like a bull, you know. So good luck. Um, uh, but it's going to impact everyone. Yes. Is it on? Is it on? All right. Uh, you wanted spice, right, Mike? Yeah, so, Santana, right, so introduce much. yourself. Stand up, please. Uh, Stand up. I'm Santana just a guy Diaz. in the kitchen um, at UC Davis Health. But uh, question, I mean, this, this sounds interesting, right? Uh, and it needs to happen. But are these ranchers going to be burdened with the cost of another certification? And then is that, because I as a buyer, or say the UC as a buyer, in an already, you know, high cost, food products, food stuff industry, I mean, there comes a point to where it's just too much. So on for everyone. So I guess that's my question. Is this, I mean, it would make sense if it turned into a certification, but again, at what cost is that gonna, because you know, there's already enough burden on people that grow organically that can't afford that certification. And an entity like ours and an institution, we need that certification or else we just can't take someone's word for it. Right, so what is the plan for that? Yeah, so it is not the state's, state's intention to have a certification program or to do that. Our intention is for our definition to apply to our policies and programs. So um, we mentioned the Healthy Soils program earlier, the SWEEP program. If you get a grant from one of those programs, you have to prove that you've put compost on the property like you said you would, or you have to prove that you've installed that irrigation equipment. Um, so the definition will really influence, um, and we don't have a program for regenerative agriculture right now, but <laughs> the, the legislature throws all kinds of fun things at us. Um, and, uh, and again, like this term has started to come up in bill language, so it will not surprise me if sometime there is a, a grant program or maybe a procurement program where in that context, you will have to be able to say what that is. Great, so I, um, I, I would be interested in Carrie and Lauren kind of engaging you, the things that worry you or the things that excite you about this. Uh, you know, Virginia can handle it, she's, she's a pro. She'll know what to say uh, in response. I am very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Everybody's so, laughing out here. Because they don't like it. Please, if, if you guys have any questions or thoughts. Um, I'll just say what I said at the meeting, which um, there was a lot of push towards organic being the entry level. And um, my comment was that might not be the best route because that, like Santana said, might be putting more burden on the producers to hit that high mark. Um, my program isn't organic, although we have all intent to get there eventually, but I work with a six different ranch producer group and to get everybody on board to organic is gonna take a while. 
Um, we are a never ever program and we don't use herbicides or pesticides, but we just don't have that organic certification. So my concern, because I had heard, you know, I'd listened to two and a half hours of this meeting of everybody circling around where the baseline would be, my concern was it being organic. Um, not that that shouldn't be part of it, but I just thought that that was my concern and a, a couple other concerns of ranchers in the room. I mean, my, my concern, which it, it seems like it happens repetitively over and over, is whenever there's a buzzword that consumers like, we end up greenwashing it and screwing it all up and the government gets involved and comes to save us. So, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, so, I'm actually, and this is just selfishly uh, for our brand, but I'm actually going to take a, a page from Joe Morris's playbook, who is one of the earlier speakers and good friend about in the future, we at Stemple Creek want to be first person certified. I'm so tired of all the certifications that we're, ref we're referring to. I probably spend two weeks a year and $10,000 a year on certifications for all the different things. And I'm like, do we really need this? Or can we just have people come and buy from us and see direct? If we're gonna sell to UC, we need it. But do I necessarily, and it's, I'm, I'm mostly asking the question for all of you smaller brands that are just starting. It's like, do you really need UC who's going to pay a little bit more than what conventional beef is to make a living? Probably not. Who you need is the consumers that are willing to pay more that want to vote with their dollars and they want to support you for what you're doing and your flavor profile and hopefully you can keep it cheaper and <clears throat> all of these things. So I don't know if that's the right answer or not or what it is, but that's kind of where my brain's going right now. I'm tired of all of the certifications, and I'm gonna probably have less or none before I have more. <laughs> wow, that's good, spicy. Good, okay, we got, we got uh, yeah, so come on, you get, Coco, just grab the first person, uh, give it to All right, him. all right, okay. I'm gonna, I'll Matthew. get spicy. I'll Great. get spicy with you. Um, so, I think one of the things, you know, we should probably distinguish between a, a few terms here, and and uh, I, I'm Matthew from Icy Foods, by the way, um, and and our our business is is the language of food, and so we think about these kinds of things a lot, uh, computable language about food, um, because we want to, we everybody wants standards, right? Everybody wants to have a standard for for what something is, and they want to know when they have by a standard, what that means. Um, and then, you know, sometimes if those standards are really important, there need to be regulations around those standards um, so that we can, you know, so that people are genuine about what they're, they're claiming. And then to Santana's point, sometimes there's a regulatory burden associated with making those regulations. But those are three distinct things, standards, regulations, and regulatory burden. So our mission as an organization is to enable people to elevate their standards while reducing the regulatory burden, right? So we wanna make it easy to make claims, but we also want, because we have technology now, we have soil sensors, we have all kinds of monitoring devices, we've got all kinds of ways for doing this, we all, consumers want visibility into their supply chain. They wanna be able to trust what they're buying, right? And, and so, in my mind, you know, what we want to do is, is transparency is the new currency, right? And if you can't be transparent about what you're doing and what you're selling, well, then you're not going to be trusted by your consumers. And the degree to which we can make it easy for you to be transparent with your data, share the data that you want, I'm not forcing anybody, but that's, and, and that's, that's where I think we need to go with technology. And that's Great. Good comment. Thank you. Uh, I am a rancher, so I grow organic beef cattle, about 140 head a year for 54 or 55 years. We've been doing that. Uh, so the, the comment I would make, having worked on, on a lot of things that involve regulations, is that some real focus and effort go into making it operable. And, and translatable and something that people can on a ranch can get their head around without heading up to wherever, the state, the county, 
federal government or whoever you're talking to on the staff side. Somebody's looking at the rules, you know. How are we going to inter interpret this legislation? A lot of those interpretations are made up by staff. Many of them, or most of them, don't make any sense if you understand how the operation actually works. So I, I think there really has to be some effort in the room of the people who are doing the work, getting together with the people who are enforcing these laws and simplifying the hell out of it. You know, less is more. And you, I just close by saying on my ranch, in 55 years, we're in our 55th year this year. Um, I, so I started when I was real young on the ranch. You know, I've been there a long time. I don't live on the ranch, but I've been around it for all that time. I would say when I was eight years old, nobody came on the ranch. No regulator, no Cal Fire, no PG&E, nobody. No, no mosquito lady, <laughs> nobody from Fish and Wildlife came over. We didn't see anybody from the Ag Department, right? In, a, in, in one week on my ranch, 52 weeks a year, four or five people come on my ranch. Imagine that. And they call on the phone. You know, I'm pg &E's coming down. We've got to move a pole. We, we've been, we're in wildfire country, so we've been through two hellacious wildfires. So I know all about that. You know, and maybe Cal Fire's coming, but actually maybe they're not coming. And you're on your own. That's another very emotional story. Those stories. But the main thing I'm saying and I'll hand the microphone back, is less is more, keep it simple, start with the people doing the work, who actually do the work, not once removed, not twice removed, not three times removed, and simplify the hell out of this. Thank you. Um, hey, I have a for question for the lady from the CDFA. Um, so closer, I, hold the mic closer to your mouth. Uh, we specialize in uh, pasture-raised pork, right? But the vast majority of pigs that are raised are not raised outdoors. So in order for us to go to our kill floor, the only one that's nearby, I know Mike's working on that issue, we, in order for us to use our kill floor, the only one that's nearby, right? Even if we carried an organic certification, which we're 10 times overqualified for, it doesn't make sense for us to get it because it can never end up on our end packaging because our kill floor will not process that paperwork in the supply chain. So if a regenerative label is attached to an organic certification, it doesn't matter if I have it or not because no one's going to believe me because I'll never be able to put it on my packaging. Whereas a company like A Greener World actually put us in a grant program to help us get rolling with a regenerative certification that we can put on after the fact to verify through their system. So my concern with this is that it's gonna mess that up for me. I mean, I just got chewed out by a grocery store last week because I'm not organic. And I, she doesn't understand, I cannot get an organic certification on my packaging. It's not possible, right? I just wanna make sure that this doesn't get tied and cut a bunch of people that are doing the right thing out of the loop because somewhere in their supply chain, somebody won't process the paperwork. What I heard is you're not going to be dealing with certification. So, and that's probably a really wise decision based on what you said. More, Joe. Joe. Uh, I just, um, relative to the, or regarding the, 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 the idea that it be organic, I just want to point out what is pretty broadly known. Every single civilization that has come and gone out of this world has been based on an organic agriculture. So organic is not necessarily regenerative by any means. Yeah. And you just ask the Roman Empire and look at the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Middle East and Libya and all these places that have had great civilizations that are no longer with us. They were organic. I like Lauren's uh, Six principles of soil health and the other things. Happy farms, happy farmers, happy wildlife. Yeah. Principles oriented. So, um, I'm Jesse, a, introduce I'm, yourself. Um, I'm Jesse Cool, and I've had uh, organic restaurants since the mid 70s. And it was at a time when um, I don't even know, was, CC, was the green label even? Yeah, so there, there were no labels. And we. Uh, what we did is what, what everybody does now is we would go to the farmer's market and talk to people. 
And now I have this young staff with me um, as an elder, trying to help them understand what they can do to get clean, organic, regenerative, all these words you're using products. And so we brought, uh, brought them here. And I think for people who are consumers, especially in our industry, to be taught again to just talk to you all and have certain standards, like uh, my chef Brian is here, and he knows to ask, how are the grapes grown? How, is, how, how, how are the animals raised? What are you feeding them? What's the land like? And even if it's not certified, honestly, it's okay, we don't care. We didn't back then either. So it's really healthy to hear that this is happening and hopefully um, you guys will be comfortable with this too, but it doesn't have to be certified. It Great. has to be just real. Hi. Oh. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, then we'll go back over there. We're just trying to get the whole room, so go for it. Hi, I'm Suzette. I'm a chef in San Francisco, and I want to say thank you. Um, in 2008, I visited Siskiyou County and was stricken and depressed with the farmers from 50 families down to five. They couldn't find slaughterhouses that were approved. Uh, they couldn't sell their beef for a livable wage. It was very dismal. Um, so I am trying to ask in a roundabout way for the whole picture. Where's the education for us as chefs? Could you please help us? Because we want to help you. And we're the closest step next to the consumer. And my consumer is baffled by so many of these terms. They don't know what to think or what to do. And they really want to do the right thing. The people who go to the farmer's market have an edge. They talk to the producers. They talk. They understand. But the people who read my menu, unless I'm listing your ranch, your name, your product, some certification, God forbid, I don't want it either. But how do we educate the chef group? How do we educate the consumer? And then let's hit the kids, too, because the kids are the wave of the future. And we've got to really convince everybody that this is the way to go, uh, that they have a choice. And I think the power and the money will follow. And so I know money is important here. We're not talking about it. We're talking from our heart right now. And so I'm so happy to be here to hear the progress that you've made, no matter what you argue over. It's so much better than it was in 2008. So I'm hoping that I can support you in the direction you're going. But please educate us. Get us involved. Have another one of these for the chefs so they can ask all of their, their purchasing program, the names they need to know, the ranches, where are they, and then let's go to the actual product. The problem I've had is when I do find a ranch, they often have to sell me whole animal. Say I don't have refrigeration for that and I want to break it down. I want to get certain cuts. I can't because they can't. So is there a consortium, I don't know, pardon my ignorance, is there a consortium among the ranchers where somehow you can pool what you offer so that if I have to get a loin, a butt, a leg, a hawk, a head, I can so that I'm not stifling the rancher from producing what he needs to produce, but I'm using what I need to sell. And so that's been a stumbling block for us, is I can't get what I need. So I want to support somebody, and they come in, and they don't fit conformity. I don't need you to be all the same, but if I order a pork loin from one guy, and it's 40 pounds, and I order a pork loin, and it's 12, I, I've now lost my ability to judge. And so I need to, on my day-to-day -day basis, be able to find some conformity, and some answers. I don't care if it's 12 or 20, just tell me so I buy the right thing. Stand, thank you, standards. So uh, there's a bigger That's picture great. here. Thank you. Thank um, you. This is beautiful, uh, and it shows the complexity of what we're facing here. And you've mentioned a few things. I'm gonna go over here for that. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the producers and to Virginia, see if they have any comments on what they've heard so far, and then we're gonna get into the question. But I wanna say this. One of the things that we learned in our early study that started, kicked this whole thing off, is there need to be more coordination between the ranchers and the producers of food. And it's not that easy to do, believe me. We can see it. There's not the, the space, the time, the desire, People are on the ranch all day or in the farm all day. It's very hard. We, we try to get people together on calls once a month. That's hard to do. So it's really hard. So we would be really open to hearing from you about how to foster this kind of collaboration. We want to know how to do it. I, I just, I'll just kind of echo or Suzette um, said about the school kids and about, um, about the chefs knowing what's going on and all this. and. What's, what's really worked for us at, at Stemple Creek, right? And we work with some distributors, like I know that Richard works with Cream Co. And, what, yeah, and we work with Cream Co. a little bit too, and we work with some other distributors. But um, what's very, very interesting is like, it's a dramatically different business being in a meat company and being a rancher or being, you know, selling quarters and halves and holes. And it's my message to everybody here that wants to start a brand is like, do it. I encourage it. 
but try and sell it direct to consumers. Once you open Pandora's box of selling to restaurants and grocers, it's a whole nother level of inventory management, HR, like all of these things that we deal, and I deal with it every day. It's the worst part of my day. The best part of my day is ranching and doing all the ranching stuff. I do the least amount of it now because we're by default, we're a meat company so that we can make more money and be a ranching company. So <clears throat> um, I would encourage you, you're in, you're in the Bay Area, but no matter where you are to find your rancher. I know some of the restaurants I work with have brought their whole staff, whole staff to the ranch to learn about everything that we do. The, the chef also has to be educated like you know, there's this big thing about, uh, we want hanger steaks. We want, you know, we want hanger steaks, Lauren. We want it on the menu five nights a week. And I'm like, okay, well, I kill 40 head a week. That's 80 pounds of hanger steak. So you're going to have to be hanger steak today, flat iron tomorrow, New York's the next day, if you want. But it's an education process. It's a give and take. And thankfully, we're in a really um, cool area here in the Bay Area where chefs want to work with us and they'll work with us. Like for example, Zuni Cafe was my first chef, I, was first place I ever started working with. And Gilbert, who you probably know, said, what do we have to do to work with you? He was like, I need you to take Chuck, I need you to take Bones, I need you to take, you know, something like that. And then every week we'd make one delivery, it would last for the whole week. And for the ranchers out there, if you're working with chefs and they don't want Bones, skip them and go to the next thing because Bones, I mean, every place you go eat that buys Bones is epic because you know they're making their own they're making everything from the base all the way up and they're cooking those bones and they're, it's just gonna be a stunning meal if they buy bones from me. That's my, my secret of where I wanna go eat. Great, Carrie. Yeah, I was gonna comment very similar to Lauren. It's work with us where we're at if you can. Um, Santana, you should talk to Santana because we've talked at length about right, right now all of our grinds, they're gone and we need to move the higher end cuts. So it's a constant circus of, you know, who's taking our higher end cuts, how, how are we going to get that high enough dollar for that ribeye so that we can give the school program and the UCs a really good price on the trim. So it's just, it's a constant battle of keeping the rancher happy and making sure they're paid enough, keeping, you know, the restaurants happy, keeping the food service happy. So if, if everyone could ha give everybody a little bit of grace in this period where we're figuring out what regenerative, regenerative is. See, I can't even say it. Um, we're figuring out what this definition is. We're figuring out what this market is because we all have to kind of work together until we can get those bigger numbers and we can get more consistency and we can make sure that every Cisco carries a regenerative product on top of like all the smaller distributors that are all kind of basically doing it all right now. Um, your comment, Suzette, made me wish that we hadn't, that Pat Mulvaney, Chef Mulvaney, hadn't walked out the door because um, he has just been so wonderful. Like when you eat at his restaurant, you see how much time he spends walking around sitting with patrons and educating them on all the things on his menu, the food system, like all of the things he deals with. Like. I've gotten just a good, as good an education from him as like, you know, what many parts of my job. So don't underestimate your own power and mystique of being a chef um, to bring that to people too. And um, yeah, I'm trying to remember some of the other comments. Like, yeah, we realize that the certifications are very burdensome, that um, there are many reason people, me, people may not go organic. So just to respond to those. Great, okay, yeah, go, yep. Please, stand up. My name is Karen Stone. Um, <clears throat> my family owns Yellow Land and Cattle Company. And I just want to say a little bit about uh, the organic, uh, the word organic being included in regenerative, uh, the regenerative label. Um, <clears throat> I feel like if organic puts is put into this label, I feel like you're going to limit a lot of farmers and ranchers uh, becoming regenerative because I just finished watching that film, Kiss the Ground. I haven't seen Common Ground, but one of the things that struck me was when the gentleman for, from uh, the NRCS went out, I think he was in the Midwest, and he was speaking to some farmers there, large industrial farmers. And he made the comment about how they 
are industrial farm they're farming thousands of acres of land and they do not understand their own soil and so and he's going around you know the country trying to teach people about regenerative agriculture and about how important soil is and i just feel like if if organic comes into the equation, I feel like you're gonna stop that momentum from people like them who maybe wanna take that step forward and become regenerative, but maybe they cannot become organic. So that's one comment. We are not organic. Um, we don't have an organic certification. I would say that we do raise our cattle organically. They don't get anything but you know the good old sunshine water and grass, but, um, but we're regenerative ranchers. You know, we work to repair the land to put it in a better state. And I think really that's what regenerative is. We're out there continuously trying to repair what we have to make it better. Uh, I was excited when I, you know, heard the word regenerative. I felt like it represented progress that all of us ultimately want to achieve. And I think we all do. It's just financially, it becomes very burdensome. And if you make it restrictive, I think it just becomes another label, like sustainable. You know, it's a thing of the past. And it was kind of like regenerative is now. And so, but regenerative does something different for me personally. It really does make me feel like it's progress, like it's hope, like we have a future. And so I would just hate to put any kind of restrictions on that that stops anyone out there from being able. Moving forward. Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the corner back there with the hand up. One here. Uh, to the right. Oh, it's Sean. Well, actually, no. oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I'm not in charge. Is Get, it on? <laughs> Go for it. Um, I, I, my name is Emery Maines. I have a small herd outside of Livermore, California that we, we raised. Put, the, put the mic closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry. Um, I was wondering if, and I don't know if this makes sense or not, but if the CDFA has thought about making the larger producers, the feedlot guys and all those guys, that seems like everybody in this room is trying not to be, has decided, had thought about making them label their beef. Right, because what most people see when they go to the stores, that stuff, right? They go to Safeway, they go to Costco, they, you know, wherever they go to buy their food, and then they see that's that's the beef they see, right? They don't they don't know the difference between someone smaller like us or anybody else versus you know driving down I five and smelling all that, all all of you know what that is. So I'm just wondering instead of because it seems like all the small producers have a lot of hoops to jump through. And it's hard to get grants, it's hard to get this, it's hard to get certifications. But it doesn't seem like any of this burden gets put on the problem or the, the reason that everybody's here. And I, I personally don't want people not to eat beef, right? Like that's not the goal. And I don't want to punish any one company from doing things the way that they think, they think it's the best way to do it. But I think if the whole general public had an idea about where that meat came from versus just the people that were searching out that healthy, that, you know what I mean, the stuff that's going to feed their soul type of, type of food, it might be some of that, some of your guys' time might be better spent regulating some of those guys rather than regulating us. Yeah, I'm, I'm appreciating all these stories, um, and I just wanted to kind of, yeah, ask a follow-up question of Virginia, because I feel like maybe I missed something, so maybe you said it already, and, and then get some of your vision for how this might play out. Um, to tell a bit about my experience with CDFA, I have too many certifications, organic, uh, an ROC on eggs and orchard crops, GAP4 on sheep, and yes, they take a lot of time and a lot of money. I've also received uh, sweep grants and HSP grants. Those are the only ones that I have to prove my practices, but I get a lot of money. Uh, so what I heard you say was that you need to define it because you're starting to acknowledge and in some cases reward regenerative practices. And 
and at the same time, uh, like NRCS borrowed a lot of the practices that you all encapsulated in HSP and now fund them for us. So obviously people are looking in California, looking at our regulators and our language. And I'm just wondering, yeah, like, um, do you foresee the definition that you come up with being borrowed by others? I'm hearing that there's not a regulatory burden. In fact, there's a benefit to producers in the form of potential granting programs. Um, but yeah, where do you see it going? Who's looking over your shoulder? Oh gosh, I mean, I've heard that a lot of folks are looking over the shoulder of this process. Um, we have folks join our listening sessions from elsewhere in the country. Um, I was at the Conference of the Parties in Dubai um, last winter and people brought it up there. So people are watching. Um, and so I can't say that it won't be borrowed. Um, I will say I've seen the word regenerative on packaging with you know no explanation of that already. So it's being used whether we like it or not. Um, and all we can really control is what it means in our state activities. Um, forgetting the rest of your question, but yeah, I mean, I yeah, grant program. So I would say that the things that we fund already, the Healthy Soils Program funds all kinds of activities that I would personally consider regenerative. They build, they heal, they sequester carbon, they help um, with retaining water in the soil. So I think that those practices in and of themselves are regenerative. Um, but suppose we had a procurement program. This does not exist. So like right now, for example, we have a farm to school program and this program helps connect local farmers with school districts to create a direct pathway for selling their produce into the schools. Sounds like there's a similar thing for beef. Um, suppose that the legislature said your, you know, some percentage of your procurement has to be regenerative now. Like how would we, would we say that that is, uh, you know, it, you do all these healthy soils practices and therefore it's regenerative or is there something greater than the, you know, the sum of all those parts that is the essence of regenerative? Um, and that's what this process is kind of talking about. It's wild. Great. Okay. Um, so Janine, and then we're going to go over here. Hi, um, I'm Janine. I'm with Sonoma County Meat Company. We are a USDA processor in Santa Rosa. We've been processing for local ranchers for 10 years. And um, thanks everyone for putting this on and for everyone's input. It's really valuable. Um, to me as a processor, it's very important that when people are purchasing, they consider when they're contributing to the local food system, what the role of the processor is, and gives that processor as much scrutiny as they are to the producer. Uh, we have a role in the supply chain, and if you're processing with a processor that doesn't have net zero goals, that isn't saying this is our contribution, this is our scope one, this is our scope two, this is our transparency in the supply chain, I think we're overlooking a very important aspect of actually reaching our net zero goals as a community. Well, that's an interesting point. What you're saying is, I mean, it's different with produce, right? Uh, a little different. Meat... This comes up in the grass project that we're working on that some of you have heard about, Growing Grass, that five-year project that's just beginning. So um, it's very hard with meat to do this versus broccoli. Broccoli comes off the farm, goes into a cooler, and then it gets, and then it gets uh, sold. Meat has so many other steps. <clears throat> it might get smoked. First of all, it's got to get slaughtered. Then it's got to get broken and packaged. Then it's got to get stored. It might get smoked. All these kinds of things happen. How do, so what you're saying is we need to think about processing if we're going to have some sort of a regenerative definition. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, in short, I think that the hard work of the ranchers is important to be carried through by the processing facility in order for the consumer to actually know what they're buying. Interesting. Okay. Let's move over here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom Richards. I'm Carrie's brother and uh, partner in Richard's Ranch and also Richard's Regenerative. Um, so Carrie and I participated in the, one of the days of the um, definition of regenerative and we, we listened to some of the comments around 
you know, organic, quote unquote, being grandfathered in. And, and maybe that's the wrong word, but that's kind of how I heard it. And I looked at that and said, you know, as a part, us as a part of this regenerative movement, we've taken a lot of work upon ourselves to really do things, um, as Karen said, the right way. And, and really, we really believe and we've worked hard and we've spent tons of money on that. And so my concern in, in listening to what I heard was that there would be a lot of people that get grandfathered into regenerative overnight and it might be some of these big uh, operations and things like that, which in my opinion would very much dilute what we're trying to accomplish. So we brought up those comments that day and I you know, stand firmly behind that, that the regenerative movement needs to really stay focused on the impacts, right? Not just, hey, checkbox and we're doing this and that, but what are the real world impacts? Um, the other comment I wanted to bring up, we're also a part of the um, Beef to Institution, which is the school program. And actually Santana has been a, a tremendous leader in that effort. And, and what I'm very thankful about his leadership and also the CDFA's uh, involvement in the Farm to School program, and also Creamco, our distributor that we work with, is that we're able to work together with Lauren, Joe, and, and other folks to basically move a lot of product that otherwise might sit. So, you know, if you're, if you're looking at starting another brand and you're worried about how you're gonna sell all these things, these programs are developing, farm to school, the CDFA, I mean, there's all the people in this room, we're all working together to create these programs, and, and they're, they're here. And so this group, you know, farm to school, beef to institution, all these different things, um, they're here, they exist, and you just have to tap into them. So, well done. thank you. Go ahead. Um, well, I just wanted to invite you all to like, please be part of this process because I'm even in this room today. I'm hearing things that are hard for me to reconcile. Like I'm hearing, keep it simple, but I'm also hearing you need to have really high standards. And so, how do we identify those standards? Um, how do we know that just because you're organic, it doesn't mean you're regenerative? So I'd need something specific to understand that. Um, Anyway, you're always welcome to email me. We have a web, uh, we have a web address for our email. It's regenerativeag, regenerativeag at cdfa.ca.gov. Um, you can send us an email. Um, we will have more listening sessions, so please come to them. I mean, these voices are so important, and I will say that um, the organic folks have organized themselves really well to show up um, in force. So if you have a different opinion, we want to hear that different opi opinion and, and please bring it. Uh, regenerative ag at cdfa.ca.gov. Having them slaughtered, butchered, distributed. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for how do I get into the flow of the commerce, uh, those folks are in this room. So we're excited for the next little bit here to sit down and talk with all of you. Um, just a brief comment. Uh, re remember that, you know, this sector might make up 2% of annual production in the country. The other 98% is made up by three companies. Tyson, right? We all know who they are. Cargill and, J and JCB, right? Those are the three company companies that are producing 98% of the beef. Yeah. Cargill, JPS, yeah. And uh, yeah. I mean, JBS and, uh, and Tyson. And Tyson, right? National so here, here's what I think we should do, right? I think we should set a standard for both organic and for uh, uh, the other regenerative category that make, you know, everybody could live with. But what would be great is if we reset the bar on the incentives those three big guys are receiving by giving us a production tax credit and accelerated depreciation. Good. Those two, two things, very good points. Those two Accelerated things, depreciation and... A production tax credit. A production tax those credit. Those two things would change our life, and you would see the 2% go to 10 or 20%. Okay. Note that, team. Somebody from our team, get that down. Okay. We have five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the crew here. Um, we, have, we brought people up here who, who are in the middle of the mess. Um, the sausage making. Um, 
And it's important. I, I, I've been in this world 30 years, and I've never had more hope about change happening. Jesse, I don't know if you feel the same. I'm just glad to hear you say that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's true. 85% or 88% is controlled by three companies. Yeah. Um, uh, if we can go get organic Costco, we know it's not the right yeah. thing. Right. Yeah. Regenerative's going out of business. Regenerative ranchers are going out of business. Other ranchers are going out of business. It's a very tough time. But you can feel things are changing. The USDA is putting out all this money. There are people asking for things. I had a conversation in the back room with someone who was talking about the people that come into their, their store, what they're looking for. People want something different. So we just have to, I think we need to collaborate more. That's my message today. We need to collaborate more. The ranchers need to become more collaborative with each other. The processors and the ranchers, the the big machines that buy a lot of product in our state that have an impact that are progressive need to work together. We need to work together more. It's not easy. But people have demonstrated it can be done. And talk to them today. Okay, you guys, closing remarks. Um, first of all, thank you for everybody in this room. This is like, this is how this happens, is producers, buyers, chefs, everybody in the room talking about this stuff. Um, I just want to, you know, reiterate that have some grace with us during this time because, you know, like, like you said, I might deliver a giant rib roast one week and a small rib roast the next week. It's still the same wonderful product, but we're going to have to portion it different, differently. So um, I, th I think, you know, everybody for putting this on, um, let's help make a really impressive and amazing market for regenerative products so we can get all of you guys on board and get all that food into the schools and UC program and make sure that we have the healthiest planet possible. And I'll also say thank you for, you know, letting me hear what you, you think today and for having me on the panel, Michael, wherever you went. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to be on the panel and uh, share my thoughts, which are sometimes popular and sometimes not. But uh, um, I would encourage all the smaller producers to hit your wagon to a producer that, or a brand that's doing this. It'll make your life a lot easier. And um, kind of try and stay in your lane where you're going to make profit and really focus on where that spot is. Um, most everybody that's, well, at least for sure Carrie and I have like learned the hard way and made tons of mistakes along the way and it's way harder than what you think like to become a brand like this but people like myself or Eel River or, or um, Richards are always looking for other people to help grow our demand and our part of me be production for us or help with production for us because we already have the machine we know how to do it. We can grow it. We're looking for good partners that can keep help us grow it to get more food, educate more people, um, more nutrient-dense food in front of the, the consumers that want it. And the more and more brands that we create are all fighting over the same space. So, like, what we need is Jesse and, and, and Emily and all of these chefs that um, to be able to get their friends to want our products, too. So it's like not 10 of us are trying to get into Flea Street or 10 of us are trying to get into Zuni Cafe or 10 of us are trying to get into Oliver's Market. There's only so much space. So the consumer ultimately is going to vote with their dollars and um, drive that demand. But it takes education. And the one thing I don't think we talked about enough today, and we don't have enough time to talk about, we could have a whole thing about this, is the school kids and teaching in the schools about about food in general. It's such garbage and um, at the schools it's such garbage and it's getting better in small areas but if you look at like the billions of dollars, literally hundreds of billions of dollars that were wasted in the last three or four years on fake meat and how it's good for you and what's how the, that agenda is educating consumers and educators, it's pretty scary. So we have to go home, make sure our kids know Invite, if you're a rancher, invite your consumers to the ranch. And this is a pet peeve of mine is like you drive by a ranch and there's not a sign up that says, this is Stemple Creek Ranch or this is Richard's Regenerative. Like, why not? What are you hiding? Like, help educate people, have them come in. There's a bunch of places that I drive by that don't say anything on it except Peligro, Danger, Do Not Enter. 
you know, and they're mostly involved feathers and birds. So I eat three eggs a day, so there's three less chickens. And <laughs> eat more beef. It's the best, highest nutrient-dense food on the planet. <laughs> thank you. So let's thank our panel. All right. Oh. All right. Uh, thank you, last panel. Uh, that was great. Um, our next activity is going to be into speed dating that Coco is going to lead. But before we do that, we're just going to do a quick rundown of our next steps and opportunities associated with our project coming up. We have a 15 minute break right now. And we have a 15 minute break, I'm being told. <laughs> um, let me, I, I'll do this, I'll, I'll run down our next steps, we'll take a break and then come back for the speed dating. So um, this project uh, officially ends at the end of October. It'll probably go a little bit longer than that. So over the next uh, six, seven, eight months, um, we want to connect people in here with two other uh, projects that are going to go on multi-year uh, for a continuation of what we're working on here. The, uh, the Growing Grass Project and the Action for Climate Smart Ag. Um, talk to Michael more. Uh, he is uh, going to be responsible for transitioning folks from this project into those other projects. Uh, Next, uh, we're going to continue the engagement that we started with the California Jobs First uh, program to really uh, try to bring uh, public money into public-private partnerships for building out uh, critical uh, meat infrastructure in regions around the Northern California. Uh, we're going to expand some of our uh, scope to um, ethnic and specialty markets over the coming half year, as well as expanding the institutional side of things over to the CSU system, in addition to the uh, UC system, as well as stadiums around the state. So um, those may be additional opportunities coming our way. Um, we will launch the information portal that we showed you a demo of earlier today. Um, we will be having our third and final event uh, like this uh, for the project sometime in late summer, early fall. And that will focus on some of these other opportunities, but um, the exact format and location is yet to be determined. Uh, we'll have a project wrap-up, final report, so information that we've gathered will be made easily accessible in kind of a report-like form as well as on this uh, web portal. And we will uh, be pursuing additional uh, funding, whether it's from CDFA, USDA, uh, other uh, places, to continue what we're working on right here. We don't want this to end in six, seven, or eight months. We want this to continue. We feel like this is just a start in a long process. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's take a break and come back and do some dating. the room that's closest thank you if you're on the side of the room that's closest to the kitchen if you could help us move your table about a foot in we're going to do the speed dating around the outside of the room <laughs> 